I'm delighted to welcome this meeting, third virtual meeting of the Council. And um, we will say prayers, but before that, I need to speak rapidly about how we are broadcasting today. This meeting will be broadcast over the internet, and for the first time today, we're broadcasting the full council via YouTube. It will be publicly available on the County Council website after the meeting, and we are streaming this meeting live to the County Democracy YouTube channel, in addition to the audio broadcast. And recordings of both will be on the internet after the meeting. And further details can be found on page three of the agenda. And I'm delighted and pleased to ask that prayers will be led by the Right Reverend Hugh Allen, O'Prien, the titular abbot of Beely and chaplain to the chairman of Essex County Council. Could you mute your microphones during prayers? Reverend Hugh. We appear not to have the Reverend Hugh just yet. Um, and I will do what I always do in these circumstances and ask Councillor Spence if he could just say a few words to commence the meeting. Mr Chairman, so we come together in this season of Advent, looking ahead to the joy of the risen Christ being born among us. And today we look ahead in hope that we may next time come together as a council and the fellowship of councillors all committed to working for the best of their communities. We look ahead to joyous reunions with families and friends. We look ahead to a brighter future for the residents of Essex and commit ourselves today that we will serve them, work for them and understand where the common purpose and sends those things that divide us. And of course, we pray for those in need, for those who mourn, for those who are ill, for those who work tirelessly to care. And we give thanks for the many blessings in our lives and commit ourselves yet again to do still more in the coming year. Amen. Amen. Uh, thank you very much for that, Councillor Spence. Uh, very, very good. All right, this marks the start of the formal meeting of the Council, and can I remind everyone, although members are attending remotely, they should remain engaged in the meeting and refrain, refrain from responding to emails and texts during the meeting. And members are reminded to keep your microphones on mute for the duration of the meeting, unless they are called to speak and wish to speak. They should remember to address all remarks through me. I can confirm that I have received a list of members wishing to speak on a variety of, of subjects. And um, I'm very pleased and it's very useful for me to have them in advance. And I will call everyone on that list. However, if others wish to speak or to raise a point of order or personal explanation, the raise hand function must be used. Don't just stick your hand up on the screen use the participants in the raise hand. Um, to use the raise function, you obviously open the participant list and hop over your name. If members wish to communicate with officers or with me, they should please send a message in the chat function, which Van Abola or Paul Turner, and not me directly. They are both with me in County Hall. I appreciate some members can't use the chat function and we've made arrangements with them individually. Barry and John, that, that's all got that work out. And please do not use the chat function to communicate more generally with the meeting as not all members have access to the chat. If you lose your connection and have to rejoin, then we'll get you back on as, as, as quickly as we can. You may want to contact either Paul or John. You have their net mobile numbers and the are aware that you've dropped out. Most voting today will be via electronic polling using Zoom. You've all had an opportunity to attend training on how to use this. When there is an electronic vote, I will separately ask Councillor Staffan and Spence for their vote. And of course, it remains open for you to request a name vote. If members want a name vote, then they should ask. And then if 10 members raise their electronic hand, then we shall have a name vote in the usual way. Now, I'll ask the Chief Executive, moving on to uh, item one, 
for apologies for absence. Kevin. Thank you very much, Chairman, and good morning to you, members. Uh, I've received two apologies um, from Councillor Beavis and Councillor Maddox. Thank you very much, Gavin. Uh, item number two, declarations of interest. And declarations obviously can be made now or at any point during the meeting if it becomes apparent that a member has an interest and needs to be declared. And if you wish to do that, to declare an interest, please raise your electronic hand now. Julie, Councillor Julie Young. Uh, yes, I think there may be several references to holiday hunger, which was an initiative that uh, First Sight in Colchester adopted and instigated. And as a trustee of um, First Sight, I wanted to declare my personal interest. Thank you, Councillor Young. Right, I think that's it. We have, oh, we're, don't we actually have Andy Wood, Councillor Wood. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. Um, it might be brought up, so I thought I'd better mention that my wife works for the Clapton Coastal Academy. Right, thank you for that, Councillor Wood. And I think that's oh, Mark, Councillor Durham. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, it's the uh, uh, same interest as uh, referred to by uh, Councillor Young, uh, because I too am a trustee um, of First Sight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Durham. Right, I think that's it. I have no more hands on that. And we'll move on to item three, which is confirmation of minutes held of the meeting held on the 13th of October. As usual, no discussion on there except on their accuracy. Any question on their accuracy needs to be raised by motion standing order 166. Um, are there any members who've got any queries on that? Councillor Pond, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, Chairman. Um, uh, just one error. Uh, page three, paragraph three, wh when we were talking about uh, Rodney Bass's political career, um, he, he was first elected. You've muted, Chris. You've muted yourself. Hello? Hello. Oh, no. no uh, yes, yeah, sorry, Chairman. Uh, I. Um, uh, just alluding to page three, paragraph three, when we were discussing the political career of Rodney Bass, um, there is an error in it in that when he was uh, first elected, uh, it was to the Malden Rural District Council, Malden District Council not having existed until uh, four or five years after the event. Thank you for that, Councillor Pond, reminding us of the Ratcliffe Maud legislation. Um, can we, with that alteration, accept the minutes, please? Are you agreed? No dissents? Agreed. That's agreed. Thank you. Right, we'll move on to item number four, uh, public questions. I have one member of the public who's registered to speak uh, before the cut off line, and that was a Mr. Lee Scott, um, who wishes to ask Councillor Kevin Bentley the following, and I think actually I'll let uh, Mr. Scott ask Councillor Bentley, the question himself. Mr. Lee Scott, are you there? Good morning, everybody. Um, can I ask the Cabinet member, please could you tell me how priority for potholes and repairs is decided? And can I thank him on behalf of the residents for recent repairs to a dangerous large pothole at the junction of Forest Lane and Chigwell High Road? Thank you. Councillor Bentley. Chairman, thank you. I, I'm being told I've got a weak internet connection this morning, so if, if any of my, what I'm about to say, can't be heard, I'm watching the chat bar. Perhaps one of the officers could just alert me, and then I'll either log out and log in back again. Um, so first of all, can I thank Scott for the question? Can I thank him also for the praise in Highways? It doesn't often come our way, but uh, when it does, it's, it's well, uh, worthwhile, and thank you. I will read an answer, because I'm going to make sure this answer is then uh, emailed uh, to Mr Scott as well. So the service delivers repairs in accordance with our published highways maintenance strategy, which is available on the Essex Highways website. We have a team of highway inspectors that inspect all highways features at different frequencies depending on the category of the road. Each defect that meets our investigatory level is risk assessed and logged onto our asset management database. The risk assessment is a risk-based judgment about the likelihood of interaction with other defect and other potential outcome of interaction 
by a highways user. Our primary aim, this is the important thing, our primary aim is to provide a safe and available highway. So this means that we prioritize those defects that are likely to cause the most interactions, but are also likely to cause the most harm or damage. As a county council, we aspire to repair all highway defects in good time. Essex is an extremely large county, and the reality is that across the network, covering more than 5,000 miles, which I always say is from Chelmsford to New York, um, with more than uh, 1,500 structures and 1,270, uh, sorry, 127,000 streetlights, there is the need to prioritise how we spend your council tax money to the best effect of all residents. I've read that, Chairman, because I'm going to now make sure that's emailed to Mr Scott, and I thank him for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bentley. You're coming through reasonably well, actually, so I wouldn't have too many concerns about that. All right, we'll move on to item number five, which is Chairman's announcements and communications. And just to confirm that should the meeting run beyond 11.30, we can do so, we'll adjourn for 10 minutes around, around 11.30. Um, if this happens, a message will be displayed for members of the public, and I will ask that all members mute their microphones and turn off their cameras. The broadcasting will also be paused. There will also be a lunch break at around 1 p.m. I'm hoping we may not need that. And should the meeting go out that long, this break will be for 30 minutes. Now, I had the sad job of announcing a, a death, yet another death of a former councillor. Former councillor Rice, and County Councillor Douglas Rice, died on the 13th of October. And Doug, uh, Councillor Rice represented the division of Braintree West from 1993 until 2001. And during his term of office, he was vice chairman of the Environment Committee and vice chairman of the Planning Committee, as well as a member of the Education Committee, Highways and Transportation Committee, Development Control and various other committees. And I would like past members to observe a minute's silence in remembrance. Thank you, members. And I'm going to move on to awards. And I'm pleased to invite Councillor Walsh to speak to inform the council about an award received a building with nature accreditation. I guess it's green infrastructure. I think there's some other good news about green flags. And uh, Councillor Walsh, the floor is yours. I'm very grateful, Chairman. Good morning, members. Um, yes, we have done very well in the uh, new accreditation building with nature, um, achieving excellent level for the Essex Green Infrastructure Strategy. Um, building with nature is the UK's first benchmark for green infrastructure at each stage of planning, design, implementation and long term management and maintenance. Building with Nature recognised that Essex County Council is committed to the principles of high quality green infrastructure which underpin the Building with Nature ben benchmark. They stated, and I quote, this strategic policy document represents a national exemplar in the design, delivery and maintenance of high quality green infrastructure for the benefit of people and wildlife now and long into the future. It is recognised and commended, it recognised and commended the work we did with Essex with the University of Essex on GIS mapping to create a robust evidence base. And as such, I want to say to the team of officers who worked on this, what a fantastic job you've done. You're right to be highly commended and you have your efforts properly recognised. And I suppose, Chairman, I have to pass to you a virtual certificate. However we do that is another challenge. Um, moving on then to uh, alert or really just to... Um, let members know that we have yet again um, been successful in achieving seven green flag awards across our country parks, recognising the high level of management uh, that goes on there and uh, really that people can, with the green flags, expect a really good experience when they arrive. Um, the country parks have proved themselves particularly important this year because of COVID 
uh, providing uh, open space uh, for exercise, uh, which has been um, very well received. And really to say that the country parks are probably seeing levels of use not experienced in, in previous years. So uh, I also would like to congratulate our country park staff those out there in the field, but also our, our office-based people as well for working so hard to achieve this uh, international accolade. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Wilson. It's really good news. Right, I'll move on to item six, and that is petitions. And I'll rapidly move off it because so far there are no petitions. If anyone has one, I, I'm usually prepared to accept them. I'm unnotified. No, thanks. Right, we'll now move on to item number seven, and uh, I'll now ask the leader of the council, Councillor David Finch, to make a statement entitled Thank you to the people of Essex. And I have four speakers after him. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, Chairman members, good morning to all of you. We have shared one of the most challenging and tragic years in our history. Some people have been hit harder by this pandemic than others, but all of us have made sacrifices. I've never been more proud to lead this council, and I've never been prouder of our staff working for this council, and I've never been more proud to call myself a resident of Essex. The everyday sacrifices and acts of kindness we have seen from the people of Essex make me humble, yet fill me with hope. When things were at their darkest during the first lockdown, when little was known of this virus and it was spreading throughout our communities, the people of Essex stood up to be counted. Much of the burden fell on our frontline workers, our own workforce, as also in the NHS, in care workers, shop workers, and many more. But there were, there were so many of you who came together as one well to offer help in any way you could. We set up the Essex Wellbeing Service and we had thousands of you volunteer. This made a huge difference to so many lives. Our partners in district, borough and city councils, with this councils and government support, also did a remarkable job housing rough sleepers over the summer and working hard to find each of them a permanent home for the long term. This indeed is something we've always worked in partnership on, and I'm pleased to say that we would increase our funding for support of homelessness by half a million pounds as of now. This additional money on top of the 3.8 million we've already spent will ensure every rough sleeper can receive support if they want it, as long as they as is needed. It will also help us to support families and individuals to keep their homes if they face the threat of eviction or homelessness. Another example of the kindness of the people of Essex as things moved online, it became clear that this could leave behind those who are much less likely to have the technology to work remotely. Hundreds of you have donated laptops that we reconditioned and are sending out to young people and their families who really need them. We will also purchase an additional thousand units and with more support from you and our local businesses, we believe that we will get to the 3,000 we need soon enough. These are a few examples of the energy, the positivity and the community spirit that inspired so many of us over the summer and continues in winter. And it's the energy and positive attitude which makes me so full of hope for our future. There is an end in sight, perhaps now, we are rolling out community testing on a vast scale in Essex and beyond. We are leading the country in our contact tracing system and we are making it even better. And we are turning our attention to the future, preparing for the time when we can resume some sort of normal life with the vaccine now on the near horizon. In the interim, while the case numbers in Essex are not dropping as quickly as we would like, we will continue to do all we can to move Essex into tier one as soon as possible. As we move into Christmas and the new year, I ask all of you to keep the hope and that energy alive. 
and yourselves, your neighbours and your loved ones, as this will be over soon, I hope. As well as residents helping friends, neighbours and even strangers, I think other positive changes this year, which gives me even higher hopes for the future. Care usage, car usage has fallen. Even after the first lockdown, it never returned to pre-COVID levels. Recycling levels have increased significantly and more and more people are walking and exploring the nature ground around them close to home. This is promising and we hope it will lead to permanent behaviour change that will help us with our ambitions to take meaningful climate action in Essex. We received the interim report of the Climate Commission last month. I'm excited by this work. I think all of us at individual level, as well as organisation level, can take meaningful action and make a difference. And indeed, the recommendations included in this report give us something very tangible to work on. We will respond in the new year with a plan to take this important agenda forward. In the last few weeks, we have started to plant 14,000 trees in Chelmer Valley and we're on track to have 25,000 of the 375,000 trees planted as part of the Eris S Forest Initiative by the end of the year. Chairman, in closing, I wish all members and residents a safe and restful Christmas. I truly believe that if we can keep helping each other, keep acting responsibly, we can look ahead with renewed optimism and a sense of hope and I look forward to working with you all in 2021. Mr Chairman, that is the statement I prepared and circulated. Today, however, I need to make one point more strongly. The people of Essex have done a brilliant job of saving lives and helping businesses survive through the discipline of hands, face and space. Sadly, however, in this run up to Christmas, we now see rises in infection rates across the county with some particular hotspots. It is critical, that, and indeed crucial, that we are to ensure the future of our businesses, our economy, our well-being, and our ability to let everyone have better lives that suppress this rise immediately. My plea to every resident, resident, therefore, is please stick to the rules and retain your discipline. To the businesses of Essex, for your own survival, please ensure that your customers are sticking to the rules and maintaining their distances. And to every councillor in the chamber, and to every elected councillor across the county, and to all others in a position of influence, this is not a message of Essex County Council. This is a message which we all need to convey. Let us create the conditions that enable us to stay in Tier 2, working for tier one as soon as possible and recognizing that tier three would be very difficult for, all, for us all. We do this with the assurance that the vaccine comes next year and we will soon be able to lead happier and hopefully more liberated lives. Thank you, Chairman. I apologize for the additional text, but I felt it was important at this time to stress the need to adhere to the hands, face and distance that is so important to securing control of the virus. So thank you, Chairman, for your indulgence. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Um, that will now be distributed to members by email. Um, I will ask questions from members. I've got Councillor Pond and Councillor Harris as uh, newcomers to my list. And I thank those members, the other government groups who have indicated which and I'll call on Councillor Mike McCrory first. Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Finch, for the advance copy. Um, my question uh, relates to the half a million pounds for homelessness and rough sleeping. I'm particularly interested to know how this funding will be spent. Is this the intention to pass some or all of it onto the district level councils. And if that is the case, how will it be allocated? 
And does it include help for those homeless families in temporary accommodation as well? Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor McCrory. Councillor Finch, would you like to answer that? Uh, Chairman, I can give a brief answer to that, but I do think in, in respect for the question, I need to give a fuller written answer. But nevertheless, the money will be um, devolved, as it has been in the past, to the organisations that we use to look after uh, the homeless and indeed to look after those people that are also on the verge of becoming homeless as well. So it is also a mentoring service as well as a provision of uh, accommodation for uh, rough sleepers as well. But I will provide a much more detailed response to that question, which I think it deserves a more detailed answer, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Thank uh, you. Uh, are you okay with that, Mike? Yes, thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Well, I'll now call on Councillor Ivan Henderson. Thank you, Chairman. And can I, first of all, um, thank the Leader for an advanced um, copy of the speech as well. And can I um, associate my group with the comments within the statement regarding the tragic and challenging time that residents across the county have had to deal with over the last few months? Can I also welcome... Uh, the comment within there about the thousands of computers for young people and families that will need them. But we also need to recognise that some of those families are struggling even to pay for the internet connections for these facilities within their own homes. Can I also welcome the, uh, on the interim climate change report? It, it's one way of seeing actually a, a economic recovery and jobs recovery across Essex. And I think we should take every advantage of that as possible. And finally, can I welcome uh, the comments regarding the home rust weekend funding over the next three, three years. It's going to be absolutely important over those next few years that we actually intervene as early as possible and we use every pre uh, prevention method we possibly can to reduce the situation where people will find themselves in that position. Will he therefore support the calls on the government by end child poverty? not to cut the £20 lifeline uplift for universal credit next April. Families could see themselves losing over a £1,000 a year and there'll be thousands of families across Essex who will suffer from that impact. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Uh, Councillor Finn, slightly <laughs> veered. Uh, thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Henderson, for the number of welcomes that you made within that um, um, each of yours and also the question that you posed. What I will do, Councillor Henderson, because I'm not close enough to the issue that you've just raised with me, what I will do is take advice from, the, um, from my officers and from other councillors, and I will provide you with a written response to that particular action that you asked of me and give you my considered view after careful consider consideration and after careful consultation. And part of that consultation, Councillor Henderson, I would hope would include with yourself as well. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Right, I'll now move on to Councillor Anne Terrell. Uh, sorry, I was put down by mistake. I didn't quite catch that, Councillor Terrell. Oh, sorry, I, I was, I'm not speaking on this item. My name was put forward by mistake. So I thought- Well, I'd that's, very, that's very useful. Thank you, Councillor Terrell. Uh, Councillor Julie Young. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman. I firstly declare a personal interest as a non-exec director of Angling Community Enterprise. My question is about the role of rollout of the vaccine. Um, obviously, during the winter time, we have winter pressures um, with staffing in terms of the health sector. And I wondered if the leader of the council could give us some reassurance about how the rollout is actually going to be undertaken and um, you know whether we've got the capacity in the system to support that rollout. Very wide Chairman. question, Councillor Young, but I'm sure he can answer it to Councillor Finch. Uh, Chairman, thank you for that. And thank you, Councillor Young, for your question as well. I would say that uh, in terms of track and trace, uh, we are an exemplar and recognised by Public Health England for doing an outstanding job with the high results that we're returning in terms of track and trace. We are very clearly committed to ensuring that the vaccine when received from government 
is rolled out within Essex as, as swiftly and as efficiently as we can be. And indeed, we have put additional funding into making sure that we have both the resource and the ability to deliver those vaccines in Essex to those that are in most need, as it is defined by the government in terms of need. So be assured that we will keep this council and in due, uh, in particular Councillor Young, notified of the progress that we're making in that regard. Thank you, Councillor Finch. I'll now move on to the two unannounced interlopers, as it were. Councillor Pond. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I, again, I thank um, the leader for having circulated a, a text of his statement in advance. Uh, I was a bit sorry to note in the text I received that we did not have uh, what he added this morning, which I think was very wise, uh, because there's a lot of euphoria about what are effectively only green, green shoots on the hillside ahead of us. Uh, I think we need to continue to enjoin on residents uh, the need to adhere to the rules, the social distancing, and the caution they must take in this difficult period over Christmas. Uh, because uh, would he agree with me that the thing we must try to do is to avoid a worsening of the situation in some of the hot spots in the county and obviate a third wave of the disease, which I think would really be a killer blow to um, our economy and our well-being. And so when he get work with Dr. Gogarty uh, to issue uh, fairly stringent guidelines about what residents should avoid doing in this difficult period, which may be um, a period before uh, we can begin to think of a normality, but I don't think we can think of it immediately. Thank you, Councillor Pond. Councillor Finch. Well, certainly, Chairman, I welcome Councillor Pond's comments in terms of the additionality of, of the text that I put on the because I felt it was important to reinforce that message and to encourage the population uh, in Essex to still adhere to the rules and the regulations that are in place. Um, and, and it's important that we do that. And secondly, clearly I will be working with Councillor Spence and, Council, and Dr. Gogarty in regard to the guidelines and with, the, with our own excellent communications department in terms of making sure those messages not only go out in the areas that are seeing a rise in the infection rates, but also across the county generally. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Right, I now have the final speaker, Councillor Dave Harris. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Leader. Uh, as other councillors have done, I welcome uh, the, the, some of the remarks and, and the, the comments you've made, uh, Leader. Um, uh, I noticed that you've mentioned very good um, figures for cycling, uh, an increase in cycling and reducing in car, which is good for climate change. In my own area, the Thomas Lord Audley School has reported, Leader, that um, they are extremely uh, increased in cycling for the local school, the children going back to schools. They're even desperate for more cycling facilities. I wonder whether the Leader could use his influence, please, uh, with government and when the next cycling grants come down, anything that, that uh, any monies that come through to assist that, um, as I hope it will, that we could actually think about schools and community facilities for storing cycles, because if that's the future, it's the future is very bright. We just need more money to pay for um, cycling facilities, cycleways and cycling storage. Thank you, Leader. Thank, thank you, you very Councillor much, Harris. Councillor. Thank you, Chairman. And Councillor Harris, thank you for your question and the, the, the request that you made. Clearly, I know that I have in, in, in the Deputy Leader and the Cabinet Member for Infrastructure, that I have a, um, an exemplar in terms of trying to move the green agenda forward, and certainly in specifics in terms of cycling and cycleways as well. I, I note your comment about the funding for the school within Colchester for storage of bikes, and I certainly will use whatever means I can to influence government in giving Essex more money to make the provisions that you've asked for, not just in your locality, but across the county. And we'll keep you posted, of course, on that particular point. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Well, that now is the end of the questions on the executive statement. And we will now move on to motions. 
And I'd like to congratulate all groups that they've managed to restrain themselves somewhat in terms of uh, amendments. It's, it's looking though we will be able to move smooth through this. I am living hope. Right. Motion number one, enabling pedestrians to travel safely. Um, initially, no speech is to be made. I'll call upon Councillor Smith to move the motion. Yeah, Mr Chairman, I shall give it a shift and move the motion, please. Okay. And um, you've moved the motion, no speech, and do you then ask the second to confirm if the motion is second, and that's you, Councillor Pond. Uh, yes, Mr Chairman, uh, I formally second the motion and I intend to speak after the proposer. Right. I have to ask if there are any amendments to the motion, and I believe there are none. Right. We'll now move on to the initial speech. Um, I'll call on the mover of the motion, Councillor Kerry Smith, to speak to the motion, and Councillor Smith, you have five minutes to do so. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I won't need the full five minutes because I think when anyone reads this motion, I think it sells itself and it explains why the administration and other opposition groups has not seeked to table am amendments to it because I think whichever part of the county we represent, be it busy urban or very quiet rural areas, we encounter these problems. So I'll just quickly speak through the four key points. I mean, the first off, why members should support this motion about extending the Greater London Authority parking ban to outside of Essex. Unfortunately, some motorists park the vehicle right across the pavement, forcing even able-bodied people into the road. Now, if you have any form of disability or vision impairment, that's such a dangerous thing, forcing into a busy road because someone wants to park right across the pavement. And the only people who can presently enforce that are the police. And the police have far more better things to do than be going out dealing with cars parked right across the pavement. I grew up in the London Borough of Barking and Dagenham, had a car while I was there, and it works fine. They paint bays on the pavements, install little signs on lampposts to give permission in suitable locations where people can place two wheels of their vehicle on the pavement and still allow pedestrians to pass. It works in London, it will work well in this county, and also it will save a bit of money on pavement repair budget. So that's another good reason to vote for it. The second point is about these installing tactile pavements. If members haven't seen them, they're like these buff-coloured um, paving slabs with these little raised knobbly bits on, and they're placed at where the pavement drops to allow the highway to pass. Now, for people who've got vision impairment, they feel that instantly under their foot, and they know there's, there's a place they're going to have to stop and look out for cars somehow and cross the road as safely as they can. Now, we can take these through the LHP, and recently the scheme installed on Sparrow's Herb. Great scheme, but it took nearly two years to get installed. Whereas if the administration considers the point in point two, uh, within the 2021-2022 uh, budget, put some money for installing tactile paving across the county. So that would mean if Councillor Bentley is still in his place or promoting or whoever takes his place after that, um, says to each county member, you can pick two, five, ten junctions to have tactile paving. And as we've seen with the previous potter and pa um, pavement repairs, if we go through the cabinet member for highways, it gets done rather quickly. So that's a point for the administration to consider. And I know you're working on your budget, but something's got to be nothing, better than nothing. The third point is the neat box scheme, which is about developing a smartphone app. Now in Basildon, we're working on what we called unofficially the Purple Pound Project or officially the Inclusive Basildon. And that comes under my remit at Basildon Council. And, Councillor Henry, who was working with me on that on my committee, and what we're looking at is creating an app um, using a supplier who's already dealing with local authorities in Scotland and now Peterborough. So you get your app, you go up to the crossings, you press the button, and it will tell you when it's safe to cross, and it will also tell the traffic lights um, to give you a few extra seconds to cross. So it's worth members, while this debate's going on, looking up the NEAT box, N-E-A-T-E -E box, and it's their app. It's quite a clever scheme. I understand it's about £600 for the materials to upgrade, and then, of course, you've got to add on to the labour. But in all our town centres, we're going to see redevelopments because what COVID's done to the high street 
be it something as grand as what's going on in Basildon or something modest that could be happening in your division. If we've got developers spending money, why not get them to pay for these devices such as neat boxes? And the third point, fourth point on my motion has been put forward by my colleague, Councillor Abbott, and I think that just makes common sense just to have a uniform signage program across Essex. I think that's quite a sensible point. Just to conclude, members, is that this motion is here to help all residents of Essex. And I think we can pass something today that will make lives better and enable more people to travel independently, regardless of age or disability. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Smith. You uh, within 25 seconds. It's pretty good going. Right, we will now start the debate. And just to let Councillor Abbott know, I have added him to the already... Um, informed list. Um, I'll start um, with Councillor Julie Young. Uh, Chairman, on a point of order, uh, may I speak now to second the motion? Um, I'm just asking, actually. If you're not reserving your rights, then Councillor Pond, I think down here is um, winding up as, as, as a speaker. But if you wish to speak now, by all means do so, but you lose that reserving. You're still muted, Chris. I've prepared uh, to, to second the motion and have great pleasure in doing so. Uh, and I wanted to take the opportunity to reply, reply to a few points which have been made in correspondence. The motion does not mean uh, that it would be applied to every last street in the county. Uh, it simply uh, means that, that no parking on pavements would be the default position. Uh, the London scheme uh, provides, and has always provided, uh, that uh, very narrow streets will be uh, exempted, and the, but they are exempted from the general rule. If you didn't do that, you wouldn't be able to get anything down the street. So uh, those who represent divisions with lots of narrow residential streets have nothing to fear. There is indeed a traffic sign in the schedule, which is Schedule 3.3, Item 2 of the 2016 Traffic uh, General Signs and General Regulations, uh, which provide that you can exempt a particular part of a street. But uh, we believe that the default must be that pavements are for pedestrians. Uh, how many times have we all seen the elderly, the sight impaired, the disabled and children having to go out into the traffic to get round an, a, a car which has been parked uh, inconsiderately and dangerously? Uh, and I think we need uh, to uh, establish that as a principle in our county. And the motion seeks to uh, make sure that the administration write to the government to do that. The default must be no parking on pavements. May I just amplify our illusion in the motion uh, to school streets? And I declare an interest uh, as I live in a street with a 650 place primary school. I was observing only this morning, this foggy morning, uh, how parents and children endeavouring uh, to socially distance had to step out between parked vehicles into the road and uh, in the face of moving vehicles, bringing other children to school. No child at the primary school near me lives more than a mile from the, uh, from the school. And uh, for the safety of all concerned, uh, I think Councillor Bentley needs to get on and get on a pace uh, with the designation of school street. It will make not only for safety, but health and well-being for all concerned. Uh, much better air quality as well around school. It was in 1972 that the children from the, the school near me first asked for traffic calming measures. Uh, their pleas were heard in partly in 1992 and the motion seeks to make a school street uh, the norm in this sort of area. Thank you, Chair. Extremely well timed, Councillor Pond. Now, you have actually, therefore, not reserved, and I'm 
wanted to ask Councillor Abbott, who stuck his hand up, to the winding up for this uh, motion. Right, so apologies, Councillor Young. Um, I didn't see a hand from Councillor Pond. He just sort of appeared on the screen. Councillor Young. Okay, well, before I kick off, I put a few, few, few points for you, Mr Chairman. Maybe it might be a good idea if you line the speakers up a little bit. So you say, you know, I've got Councillor Young follow, you know, maybe the three that are next, because then we can get ourselves unmuted and ready to go um, so we won't be using up any time. I know I've used up a bit of my time. In no, no, I won't. I'll take that into account, Councillor Young. Thank you very much. Not a problem, but I am very quick on the mute myself, so I anticipate that everyone else will be able to do it. Well, you know, we, we all um, have our axe to grind. Anyway, um, I won't take up too much of a time because um, Councillor Pond has actually covered most of the things that I actually wanted to say. And when I saw the motion, um, you will know as a, a fellow Colchester resident that um, just after the millennium, uh, the planning was such in Colchester that we had um, a number of um, uh, places where the design of the um, estate meant that we had very narrow roads. Um, and initially, when I saw the wording of this uh, motion, I was a bit concerned that it would mean that those roads would um, have a problem because if you park the cars on the solely on the road in those streets, you wouldn't get else uh, able to drive down the road so with the movers uh, reassurance that there can be provision made for streets like that then you know the Labour group are very happy to support this motion I completely um, endorse what uh, Councillor Pond has said about the rollout of school streets as soon as I heard about this initiative I applied for the two schools in Wiveno specifically to be uh, created in school streets and I think it's something that we should aspire to to roll out uh, throughout the rest of the county and it'd be really good to hear from Councillor Bentley how we're progressing on uh, moving forward with school streets. For some areas it may not be appropriate but certainly for those two, two schools in Wiverno it definitely would be appropriate to bring in school streets because as Councillor Pond has said, that's really important for issues such as air quality and children are much more affected by the effects of um, pollution. Um, I'll leave it there and um, thank you very much. Councillor Young, and of course you can't predict that I might get a, a, a random caller and in fact my next person I'm going to ask is, I believe Councillor Aspinall, I saw your phone symbol coming up on, would you like to speak now? Or do you wish to speak? Yes, Chairman. Thank you. Chris Sonberry. Thank you. Um, yes, well, I've seen many motions come to Essex County Council over the years, and a lot of them just fade into obscurity. Nothing's ever taken up. Nothing's ever progressed. This is one I hope that we take and make some tangible difference to the residents and the pedestrians and car move, uh, owners in Essex. I totally agree with the premise of this. It makes sense that we take on board the issue of pavement parking in terms of less damage to the existing pavement that we as a county have to repair. We could make a difference in the pavement completely so that cars can access more readily and safely. But the most important thing to me in all of this is being able to roll it out in terms of enforcement. I can't speak for NEP, but SEP certainly can't cope with the additional pressures that this COVID pandemic has caused. We have pavements throughout the borough of Brentwood being parked on all the time. The lack of enforcement only increases and encourages others to do so. And it, it's, it is a, I'm not saying Brentwood's alone in this, it must be rolling out all over the county, but SEP needs more money spent in employing more people to be able to enforce on our behalf. That in itself will generate funds, no doubt. 
this is something that needs to be addressed immediately. Otherwise, we can find ourselves in all sorts of problems infrastructure-wise going forward. And Count, Councillor Bentley's uh, portfolio will be needing an additional millions from the government to be able to repair all the pavements that are being damaged. Also, if, could we look at the possibility of what I believe Epping are doing, Epping Forest, which is to introduce red lines in places that will stop the uh, the parking on pavements that, as uh, Councillor Smith illustrated, people with uh, children, um, less able-bodied and harder sight can actually transfer trans- uh progress um, safely and out without going into the road. We can all name many streets in our towns and boroughs that, that this is happening. So I fully endorse and support, but beg the county for a good look at SEP and maybe NEP that will need this additional fund. Thank you, Councillor Aspinall. And uh, when I see your symbol come up, we'll use the same system. That's worked very well indeed. Um, taking on from Councillor Young's suggestion, I have councillors, this is the order they'll come in, councillors Wood, Kendall, Wagland, Mitchell, and Councillor Bentley will be the last, and uh, I'll ask for Councillor Abbott to wind up in, in place in lieu of Councillor Pond. So I'll move now to Councillor Wood. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I fully support this motion, um, and, I, and I have the same uh, as I've actually been assured that the new road, the new estate that's been built in my way, which are narrow roads, will be exempt. So I'm fully supportive of that. I am concerned uh, with, with what's happened at the moment with people parking the road. They do damage the actual pavements. Um, yeah, they do damage the pavements. Um, and I've got a few, few, a lot of roads in my area which. Uh, people park on the yeah, pavement. They're doing it on a regular basis now. Um, it's, it's regularly done, and nothing's been done about it. Oh. And I do have a lot of people moving onto the road, which is dangerous. So I really do fully support this motion, and I will be voting for this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Wood. I just lost my clock, and you you, you did very well on that actually. Uh, right, Councillor Kendall. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairman. Um, I too welcome this motion. Um, I would like to thank the, the independent group for bringing it forward. Um, a few years ago, I was asked by um, the Guide Dogs for the Blind Association to take part in a blindfold challenge in Brentwood High Street so that I could gain some understanding of what it was like for a visually impaired person to visit the high street and try and navigate it safely. Um, I have to say, I found it a very scary uh, experience, but also it was a very useful one because it highlighted a number of serious issues that visually impaired people have to deal with. Um, I'm very pleased at the time I was in correspondence with uh, Councillor Bentley, who I think has also done the challenge. And um, the county was able to address a number of these issues and tactile paving was installed in the high street. And also there was a reduction in the number of A boards as well. Um, changes in these two areas have made a major difference to visually impaired people, but there is still much more work to be done across the borough. So that's why I particularly welcome um, the point two in the motion. Um, we've had the pothole repair programme, the pavement repair programme. I think, as Councillor Smith has said, um, if there was an opportunity for some specific funding on tactile paving, where we came up with two or three examples each as county members, it would be very useful. Um, like Councillor Smith, I too put a scheme through my local LHP and it took me about 18 months to, to get in place. So anything that could speed up that process has to be welcomed. Um, I do agree with what Councillor Aspinall said about um, enforcement. Um, I think with any regulations, enforcement is key. And I know the police at the moment, parking on pavements, um, I'm told, is their responsibility. Um, certainly is in Brentwood, but it's a very low priority at the moment. And I think if we're going to get proper enforcement, we do need more funding for people like SEP, or we need the powers definitely um, passed on to the enforcement teams at a district county, sorry, district borough or a city level. 
Um, in closing, I'd like to also agree with Councillor Pond about the, the, the Safer School Streets. I think that is an, an initiative that we should drive forward. And I hope that all members, um, Chair, will get behind this very important motion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Campbell. Um, uh, my next speaker is Councillor Leslie Wagland. My apologies, Chair. I'm not as quick as you are. I, I do apologise. Um, I'm delighted to respond in kind to this motion with its enthusiasm and endorsement of the Council's work to help everyone to travel safely. Our Safer, Clean, Greener, Healthier programme is a blueprint for active travel around our county, making it much easier to walk and cycle, particularly for the majority of journeys which are for less than three miles. We've segregated cycle lanes in Chelmsford, we've made a £200,000 investment in Harlow's cycleways, and we've widened pavements with defender curbs, those are the ones in Sawyers Hall Lane, Brentwood, close to my heart, to help all the schools there, parents and children to socially distance, with support from the inimitable SEP, whose help has been absolutely invaluable. And this will hopefully move forward to school street zone type improvements, um, which are um, the ones that are uh, going to be covered hopefully by the DFT um, funding and its latest phase. And under that, we're also with other initiatives, rebalancing streets for all users in Wickford, in Brentwood, Chelmsford, Colchester, and indeed Tendry. You can't escape new technology in this portfolio. Uh, Councillor Mitchell has moved from virtual curbstones to yesterday's opening of GridServe, the world's first electric forecourt and service station at Braintree, which begins, I think, to answer the there's nowhere to charge ambivalence about electric cars. And we salute GridServe and Braintree for setting the pace in Essex. The technology always, already exists, as Councillor Smith has said, for intelligent pedestrian crossings to what the uh, founder of um, uh, Neatbox, who I follow and am a great enthusiast for, put as leveling the playing field for disability. This just waits regulatory approval for legal use in England, and I checked yesterday, still not uh, available, but we will evaluate it with um, enthusiasm as we will evaluate those initiatives which will undoubtedly follow. But the road safety initiative closest to my heart is from the Safer Essex Roads Partnership, that wonderful uh, partnership of all the organisations, including Essex, who are responsible for road safety in Essex. And this month, SERP launched its Vision Zero, that we have no more deaths and serious injuries on Essex roads by 2040. Sadly, 42 people lost their lives on our roads last year, and that is 42 too many. And each as well as the life-changing injuries that um, are uh, also uh, a feature of the SERP work, are a swathe of individual tragedies. SERP's evidence, as of yesterday in a conversation I was having with them, is that nine of those deaths were likely to have been survivable by the simple expedient of wearing a seatbelt and wearing it properly. I really would love to take this opportunity to urge everyone in to wait behind this initiative. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Wagland. Um, the following speakers will be Councillor Mitchell, Councillor Bentley, and then winding up Councillor Abbott. Councillor Mitchell. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I can't endorse Vision Zero enough, uh, but I'm not going to spend more time on that. As Chairman of the North, Park, North Essex Parking Partnership, I've been campaigning for three years to decriminalise construction parking, which is what pavement parking is. It's currently only enforceable by the police, as has been correctly said, but it's also wider ranging than a statistic pavement parking ban. Decriminalisation of obstruction would allow our award winning parking partnerships the opportunity to address more than just footway parking. We could allow specific areas of footway parking, particularly on wider footways, where access for pedestrians and wider buggies is easily managed behind responsibly, note that, parked vehicles. In built-up areas and villages alike, this has proved very useful in providing an apparent narrowing of streets, which in turn reduces speeding in these areas. Partnerships would also be able to enforce those who choose to park on junctions and verges, obstructing uh, drivers' views. I can assure members that very robust responses have already been submitted to government by both the parking partnerships 
in their role as a devolved part of Essex Highways and by default this council. I also submitted a strong personal response to the consultation. As far as tactile paving is concerned, members may be aware that all signalised crossings in Essex already have tactile pavers. All new crossings are installed with them anyway, as are many other minor crossings. However, we don't need to create a programme, as we already have one, as communicated in our monthly e-magazine, Highways Highlights, with excellent video links and diligently dissected by all, I thought. Our direct delivery gangs, which were highlighted in August 2018 and repeated in the November edition, just in case you were on holiday the first time, shows that the gangs are guided by the appropriate highways liaison officer to fast track certain tasks with tactile paving being just the sort of thing this service is designed for. While it's funded directly from LHP, from the local highways panel, the full process required for larger schemes is effectively bypassed and as all county members sit on the local highways panels, I would suggest it's in your gift to prioritise this. As mentioned by Councillor Wagland, I also chair the Essex Highways Technology Board, where we identify, evaluate, test and bring forward innovative ideas. With our partners, Ringway Jacobs, we're helping to lead the industry responses and have this year evaluated warm tarmac, electric diggers, road quake, hydrogen powered lighting towers, walking floor conveyors and new artificial intelligence driven led road surveys and a lot more, all available online in back issues of Highways Highlights, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Mitchell, who just beat the door. Um, I now have Councillor Bentley and after Councillor Bentley, we have Councillor Abbott to wind up. Councillor Bentley, you have five minutes as cabinet member. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I'll try not to use the whole five minutes because I think we're all violently agreeing, which is good news. I had to smile at the beginning, uh, Mr Chairman, when uh, Councillor Smith talked uh, about me being moved on or whatever the case may be, because I'm in that inevitable position where absolutely everyone knows how to do my job, but absolutely no one wants to do it. So I'm hoping we can prove here just how innovative actually ethics is going to be and is being already. Um, and, and as you've heard from my colleagues, both Councillor Wagner and Councillor Mitchell, both excellent deputy cabinet members in this portfolio, challenging portfolio, but we are in Essex pace setters in providing new and alternative and sustainable forms of transport. Now, it's important to say right throughout all of this, and including this motion too, this is not a war on cars. Many people have to use cars, but many more of us don't, and especially on short journeys as well. And planning does play a big issue when it comes to, you heard from Councillor Young, if you uh, plan for houses with very narrow roads, you're going to get pavement parking. So planning has a big interest in this, and that's why I'm uh, having conversations with planning colleagues across the district councils as well. Um, uh, the most important thing to remember is people aren't going to change their mode of transport, i.e. get out of their car, unless there's better, cheaper and more reliable alternatives. And once again, Essex is leading the way. Uh, as many of you have heard, you heard Councillor Wagner refer to, yes, these great news, the world's first, I understand, electric charging forecourt, uh, and huge praise has to go to our colleagues, Councillor Butland and Councillor Cunningham over at Braintree District Council and others for leading the way there. And I'm delighted that through my colleague, Councillor Summer Walsh, we're able to support that with Essex County Council. The first in the world in Essex, and there's going to be more as we make this shift into better kind of cars and also alternative to cars as well. Now, the suggestions within the motion are very good, many of which, of course, we are doing or certainly are underway or about to be underway. I thank uh, the proposer and seconder of the motions and the people who have spoken so far. Each of these areas where we haven't already started work, we will thoroughly investigate and look at their potential. Uh, and as I said, if they're not underway yet, then we will. Certainly around pavement parking, you've heard from Councillor Robert Mitchell, uh, it's not legal yet to, to uh, stop that in Essex, but the government is looking to do that. It's not right for every single street, as you've heard, but it could be the default position because it's important that people in wheelchairs pushing prams and buggies and that sort of thing have equal rights to walk, as motorists have equal rights to be on the cars in their cars and parking as well. So it's about a fine balance. It won't be right for everywhere, but where we can, we'll look at that and we'll start to do that sort as soon as we get the authority to do it. Tactile paving is hugely important. <coughs> many of our crossings have tactile paving, as you will see, and many more need that as well. If we're going to encourage more people to walk, then for those who are visually impaired, we need to make sure they have proper safety when crossing roads as well. 
to look to increase that. It all comes down to money and, of course, negotiation as well. But these are very important things. What is the most important thing is how we're starting to change people's habits by putting proper alternatives in. And again, that is where Essex is leading the way. You've heard of lots of initiatives this morning from my two cabinet colleagues. You've heard from me as well, the kind of things we are doing, supporting our district colleagues as well, who are also supporting us in many of these areas. The money we've received from government, the largest amount of money for what we call emergency active travel fund too, uh, is actually coming to Essex. And we're working right across the piece, not just with district colleagues in councils, but also uh, local organisations and local bodies that represent walkers, cyclists and businesses as well to make sure this happens. You increase footfall by having more people walking around. That's the most important thing. That's what we want to help our businesses. So we are looking to fund better, cheaper, sustainable ways for our residents to move around, which will include cars, but hopefully less of them in the future because those better alternatives will be there. So what is important for all of us in this motion and beyond and the future as well, and well, as long as I sit here and hopefully my successes as well, that in Essex we can all lead safer, greener, healthier lives. Mr Chairman, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Right, I will now call on Councillor Abbott who will uh, conclude the debate. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Mr Chairman? Yeah. Um, there have been many good contributions uh, to this debate and it's been good to see um, so many positive contributions. I would though perhaps um, very gently caution um, administration, cabinet and um, deputy cabinet members that if all of the things they said were being done completely across the county, then of course there wouldn't be a need for this motion. It's because we feel more needs to be done that the motion um, is there. Um, and I think also the delivery of some of the good things, which has happened in recent times, has been quite patchy across the county. I mean, I for one in Whitham uh, Northern Division, and I'm sure many other uh, divisional members will recognise that some of the funding has not yet come to particularly the more rural areas and the village areas where we need we need more investment. Um, pavement parking, virtually everyone has mentioned, is unfortunately endemic in some locations, forcing people to walk in the road and is very rarely enforced by the police. So clearly that does need a more comprehensive, holistic and different way of, of dealing with it. And it, it simply shouldn't be the case that people should be forced to walk in the road by inconsiderate parking. Uh, calming near schools should be a default. Every single school in the, in the county should have calming around it, reducing speeds and making it more safer for um, parents and children to access the, the school area. Um, personally, I very much agree with the idea of the direct option for tactile paving at crossings. Um, take on board what the uh, Deputy Cabinet members said about new crossings, but there are many crossing points in the county where there, is, there isn't tactile crossing. In fact, I know of some where there's not even drop curbs, which are preferred places where people do, do cross. So we need to be um, addressing that issue as well. And that's particularly important because we do face a funding crisis at some of the LHPs. Braintree has now got a six year waiting list um, and the, the, the process is um, can take too long to get these things delivered. Um, we need to be delivering joined up pedestrian and cycling routes. And I think that, as, as some speakers have said, is particularly important as we recover from COVID and we put in the infrastructure we need uh, to give everyone the best opportunities where they can to walk and cycle. And again, I would emphasize the need to include rural and, and village areas in that. Um, to introduce perhaps the first area of controversy, I would ask, and this is something I've raised previously, why the County Council in its planning function often doesn't take up the opportunity to use more Section 106 money more effectively. Uh, in the division I represent, we've had two zebra crossings refused, uh, where I specifically asked, could, could they be uh, Section 106 funded in association with significant housing developments? And we were turned down. That seems a missed opportunity when when public money is so tight. So in conclusion, uh, Mr Chairman, um, this, this really shouldn't be hard work. It's very good to see um, so much positive contributions and I hope all members can support the motion. Thank you. Um, right, we'll now go to the vote. Um, and since there are no amendments, it is the substantive item. Right. How do I do this? Here it comes up, it should be on the screen. Please cast your vote. 
And for once, I'm going to vote because I think it's a very good one. And now I need to ask Councillor Spence, what do you, which way do you vote? For, Mr Chairman. And Councillor Aspinall? Councillor Aspinall, for, Chairman. Thank you very much. We'll wait for the votes to come in. Is that you? Seems like the internet is about as fast as the A12 was this morning. Right. Those four, 63. Those against, one. And those who abstained, two. The motion is carried. Thank you very much. We'll now move on to motion number two. And this Sorry. is tackling... Sorry, Chairman. Can I just come back on that? Sorry, Chairman. I was away because I've had indigestion, so I couldn't vote. But I would have voted for if I had done. Sorry about that. Uh, OK, well, we'll see if we can add that to uh, Councillor Wood. Um, it was carried anyway, but this is useful for you to say so. Um, right, um, there is an amendment on this one, so we'll start off with calling Councillor Scordis to propose the motion, but he can re he will reserve. So, if you'd like to do that, Councillor Scordis, move the motion. Uh, formally move, Mr. Chairman. And reserve, right? And um, I'll now ask Councillor Henderson as the second. Um, that the motion is seconded and whether you want to reserve. The second chairman and reserve my right to speak at the end. And that's fine. Um, now, are there any amendments to the motion? Yes, there are. And one amendment has been received from the Conservative group proposed by Councillor Gooding and seconded by Councillor Madding. Councillor Gooding, would you like to formally propose the amendment and reserve? I will formally uh, propose the amendment and reserve. And Councillor um, Madden, will you second the amendment and say whether you wish to speak at the start or reserve until later? Formally seconded the motion and reserve my right to speak later. Right. Thank you, Councillor Madden. Are there any other amendments to the motion? No, there are not. Um, and then I'll call upon Councillor Scordis to speak to the motion. Councillor Scordis, you've got five minutes. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, inequality. It has become something that has widened over the decades and it has been widely exposed to the public during the COVID-19 crisis, yeah, well, just, uh, especially by the work of Marcus Rashford. It has been debated by academics for years and has, but has been widely ignored. However, as communities have come together during COVID-19 and many people have found themselves destitute due to the crisis, the topic has now gained the attention it deserves. Over the last decade, we have seen food bank usage rise higher than wages and spiral out of control as families do not have enough to eat. In the fifth richest country in the world, this is shame us all. What this crisis has done is remind people that those using food banks are not lazy or scroungers. They're people who have fallen on hard times and it turns out that a lot of people out there just don't have a lot of money. When people use a food bank, they're using it as a last resort usually embarrassed to turn up or in tears with no other options. Today, there are families who've never claimed welfare before who are now reliant on food banks after being made redundant. And with the economic recession we're likely to face, these numbers will rise. Inequality itself is systemic in our society. It's in our education system, not just with affluent families having the benefit of paying for private education or a private tutor, but poorer families having no recourse to books, no time to teach their children literacy and numeracy as they're working three jobs to make ends meet, or they didn't have the education to be able to help. Poor families are also less likely to have um, room for children to study and learn, as well as lacking tools like individual laptops and tablets for online learning. They're also less likely to have any books in their household. Studies have shown that children who grow up in a house full of books dramatically outperform those who do not. 
housing. If you come from a moderately wealthy background, you can buy a house in your 20s with help from your parents. If you can't pay the mortgage, and it's likely you can move back into your old bedroom. People don't always have this option. If single, you end up in a mixed HMO with limited personal space. That's a school. Just, family, just, just for yeah. a moment, someone else has got their microphone on, like you hear background noise, and it, it, it's not doing you any favours. Could whoever has got a microphone on kindly mute it? I couldn't see them. She had a quick... If everyone could be... Oh, there we go. All good. Okay. John Baker. Yeah. Okay, let me start again, Chairman. Where was I? Right. Uh, yes. So um, if you can't pay the mortgage and are evicted, it's likely you can move into your old bedroom. Poorer people don't always have this option. If single, you end up in a mixed HMO with limited personal space. In a family, you're likely to be transient, which can mean a change in schools for the kids, or end up in temporary accommodation if you're evicted with no hope in sight of a place to call home. Moving home to your parents if from a poor background is not always a viable option. In health, inequality is shown by the fact the poorer you are, the earlier you die. And in employment, inequality is also present. Having worked in retail to make ends meet, you're on the floor all day doing a job that does nothing to exercise the mind. When you come home, you hope to be able to apply for other jobs, but you come home absolutely fatigued. And being on a low wage, you might not even have access to a computer to even type or update your CV. When I joined the Labour Party, my socialism was and still rooted in the belief of everyone having a good quality of life, not a socialism of bringing everyone down. Yeah. Socialism rooted in a belief that every child and adult should have the opportunity to succeed and have the tools available to allow them to succeed. This is why Labour is calling on the council to take what action it can today. This includes an extension of our holiday hunger programme which initially neglected areas of high deprivation, such as Harwich and Dovercourt, to create youth zones to help the most underprivileged, to investigate our contract with Virgin Care, who themselves have cut services to save on costings, and to set up a task and finish group to maximise opportunities for young people in Essex. As it stands, your future is much more likely to be decided by your background, postcode and who you know. The barriers we face look insurmountable at times, but we must do all we can to make Britain a fair place where all can succeed and work ethic and ability are rewarded. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, despite the slight interruption. <laughs> well, thank you, Council Schools. I was just actually asking uh, Mr. Turner not to ring the bell to give you a little bit extra time. As you need to do. So I, I will be as fair as I can. Um, right, I think we now move on to... Um, moving the Conservative Amendment, and that's Councillor Ray Gooding, who has three minutes to, to uh, move the amendment. Well, thank you, Mr Chairman. I wasn't sure whether I had um, a longer than that as a Cabinet member, but I'll try to, to uh, re um, make sure that I'm succinct enough to retain within, remain within the three minutes. Um, I think the Labour motion has uh, a lot to, to say for it. Um, I was somewhat concerned that it may be uh, rather political and, and, and clearly inevitably it is. But in the spirit of um, uh, uh, the fact that we're approaching Christmas, I'd like to take it in, in, in the manner in which it was attended. However, the reason for um, offering the amendment is to separate from the detail within that motion those things which are achievable and, and, uh, achievable and those things which are not. And I would hope that... Um, in that uh, people would understand um, the, the thinking that we have. Again, I'm going to, in order to be succinct, I will restrict it to, to comment on uh, one item within the, um, within the uh, 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 motions, um, and that's the, the issue of youth services. Um, I do have significant concern about uh, the, the reliance on youth zones. Um, I could make a political comment and say it, it, it's, it's quite surprising that the Labour Party would want to effectively privatise the youth services. Um, and I say that because if by youth zones um, the motion implies on-site youth zones, who are a, a, a charitably, charitably based organisation who seek significant funding from uh, local councils to set up um, uh, their uh, facilities in particular locations, my fear is that that's unaffordable. 
the capital expenditure on each youth zone for the council would be 50% subscription uh, or roughly four million pounds in each location with then an ongoing cost of a million pounds per youth zone in perpetuity. That's very difficult. And to think that we had 12 of those in, in the, uh, the county would clearly be unaffordable. If we contrast that, the youth service that we currently run reaches all parts, it reaches everywhere. The difficulty with the youth zones is that if you picked one in say Basildon, you'd, uh, sorry, in, in, in say Braintree, you'd put it in Braintree town. All of those rural areas would have no access at all. And unfortunately, the drug gangs and the county line organizations don't restrict themselves to individual areas. They'll pick on the areas that they can get access. And I have a significant fear that those rural locations where often deprivation exists and particularly post COVID will be left out. So I would really want to make sure that rather than following a single model, which this, uh, the original motion implies, we continue to build on the youth services that we've got. We've managed to, to address during COVID uh, the needs of an awful lot of people. And I won't go into the detail, but I did send last night in preparation for this, some details of what we have achieved through our youth services across the county. Um, all of the youth zones across the country have been closed during this process. That's unfortunate for them, and more importantly, unfortunate, unfortunate for the young people that, that uh, we're trying to serve. I want to make sure that everybody gets access to youth services at the time they need them. And that we're dealing not just with the young people who'd be likely to turn up to the youth centre, but most importantly, the hard to reach ones that won't go anywhere near them. They're the ones that really are at the most risk of exploitation and at the most risk of um, the, the things that we want to address. So I would hope that the, um, the amendment could be supported in the spirit in which this is all meant. And, and just a quick advert, uh, if I may, we um, had a £100,000 provision uh, for youth strategy groups uh, in the budget last year. Unfortunately, only two applications have, have been made for that so far. So I would urge the, the remaining youth strategy groups to um, get on with putting applications in before this closes. The facilities are there. We need to make sure they're delivered um, across the piece in the very best way. Uh, so I'd ask members to support the, uh, the amendment because I think it addresses the, um, the intent of and spirit of the original motion, but actually puts some bones to what we really can achieve. And I know that uh, others are going to speak on other parts of this, but I've taken up enough time now. So thank you very much for your indulgence, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Gooding. And I will explain that, of course, if you were... If if you were the cabinet member for this specific issue, you would get five minutes. So had, had Councillor McKinley been speaking, she would have got five minutes. That is the protocol. I think I, if Nonetheless, I'm... my my absolute generosity as a as, as an officer to carry on a little bit longer than normal. Nonetheless, I now will move on to asking Councillor Madden to speak at this point, unless he wishes to defer it to later. And you have three minutes, Councillor Madden, if you're speaking. I did uh, acknowledge, second it, and I did say that I'd defer speech. Uh, yes, it depends where you defer it to, Councillor Madden. You can yeah, defer it to the queue, or you can wait a little, little later. Right, we will start the debate in a moment. Um, Councillor McKinley, or their nominee, will have five minutes to speak in the debate. In the, debate. the first tranche will be Councillor Deakin, Councillor Kendall, Councillor Wood, Councillor Young, Councillor Davies. Councillor Reid, Councillor Smith, Councillor Butland, Councillor Chandler, Councillor Sheldon. Councillor Harris, you do have the opportunity to state beforehand, but I do see your hand up. It might be a residual, but I'll put you on the list just in case it's not. Right, Councillor Deakin. Thank you, Chairman. Inequality is most felt by ethnic minority groups, those on low incomes, young people and the LGBTQ plus community. And this pandemic has in many ways reinforced existing inequalities. Our youth service did a great job transferring to online provision. However, many youngsters access their internet through schools and libraries. And of course, none of these were available during lockdown. 
The young LGBTQ plus community are sometimes left out of initiatives and many have moved back to live with family during the pandemic and this is not always a safe place for them to speak freely and rising sort of feelings of isolation, more anxiety and depression for many youngsters, but particularly for those in the LGBTQ plus community. Uh, many young people have lost their community, their social uh, settings, their safe places since the pandemic began. And with nothing but TV and constant COVID-19 updates, um, this has really increased anxiety amongst our young people. There are real benefits, I believe, in the creation of the youth zones. Uh, these do provide an almost wraparound service for our young people, offering a safe place where youngsters can meet, talk, explore their interests and try new things. Admittedly, we have to be within the confines of what we are allowed to do during COVID-19. But these youth zones, and I apologise, my home phone has just started ringing. The youth zones set up will ensure that our youth are offered support and food if necessary. If they're unable to pay, the youth zone will place credit on a pass and allow them to purchase food on site, thus ensuring they will get some hot food during the day. The youth zones are inclusive and a key resource to youth provision, particularly in areas of real deprivation. The youngsters are encouraged to hold events and find innovative ways to raise funds and to ensure that their youth zone continues to be available to all. And I do understand what Councillor Gooding did say about the subsidies that are required, but certainly from the opportunity that I had to go and visit uh, one youth zone, there was a lot, and a lot of fundraising going on by the, the group themselves, which was very encouraging. And they are encouraged to, to find ways, as I say, to really raise funds and keep things going. And it offers the young people a sense of ownership of the youth zone. They are working across the country. So they are a good, there are very good examples. And I believe that the young people would really benefit from these facilities. I support the Labour motion. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Deakin. Uh, our next speaker is Councillor Kendall. Uh, thank you, um, Chairman. Um, when I saw this motion from the, uh, the Labour group, which I fully support, um, I knew the administration would um, probably put an amendment in um, on it because um, sadly it seems any criticism of um, this Tory government or indeed the administration is never welcomed. And um, I think there are times when we do have to take it on the chin a bit. And I think the administration should, should note that. Um, I'll be voting against the Conservative Amendment because, sadly to me, it fails to reflect some of the reality of what's actually happening on the ground in many communities. I think members across the Chamber, if we were being honest with ourselves, would know that cuts to public services have made a major difference to the lives of many families across Essex. Um, I don't believe that fact should be conveniently airbrushed out of the motion, however hard it is to accept, because is the reality um, of what a number of residents are facing. Um, this council, in my view, should be thanking um, Marcus Rashford for his remarkable campaign and not just acknowledging it. To just acknowledge it, as the amendment does, in my view, is churlish. Marcus Rashford should be congratulated on a superb campaign that really highlighted an important issue across the media and quite rightly, force the government to reconsider its position. Marcus, in my view, is an excellent role model for many young people. And at a time when young people are looking for role models, what better than looking at the actions that he has done both on the pitch, obviously for his team, um, and off the pitch with this campaign. And I think, um, you know, these actions should be supported and encouraged, not simply acknowledged. The county is doing some very good youth work um, as those of us who are members of the youth strategy groups would know, and also with the email that came out from Councillor Gooding last night, gave some very good examples. However, I am sorry that the youth zones have been excluded from the amendment. I think we should certainly be looking at piloting a youth zone um, in Essex. Yes, there are costs attached to it, 
But as Councillor Deacon has said, these are extraordinary times that we face. And there are many young people facing a lot of issues, particularly with mental health. And I think, you know, a youth zone which was piloted would be a little bit of a beacon for some of these young people who are looking to the various levels of councils across Essex to do something on their behalf. Um, finally, um, I think it's sad to see the kindness of the community highlighted in the original motion um, has somehow been sort of relegated to a minor point behind the actions of the government and the county council. Um, I'm pleased that earlier Councillor Finch mentioned um, his thanks to residents, which I think was quite right. To do so. But these are the people who are the unsung heroes, Chairman. These are our residents, and we should all be thanking them. Thank you. Our next speaker is Councillor Andy Wood. Thank you, Chairman. Um, first of all, I'd like to mention that in 2020, coming at 2021, and we still are reliant on food banks. Now, that is incredible, as well as we're the fifth largest, uh, fifth um, most profitable uh, country in the world. It's disgusting. And it needs to be sorted. And I'm gonna, I will vote for the uh, the Labour motion because I live in an area, Clapton and Jaywick, which has high poverty. Um, we have one of the worst children's poverty in Essex on my one of my estates. And I'm really concerned that when I speak to my residents, and in fact, I would like Mr. Gooding to come down with me and see how some of my residents have to live, because in this day and age. It's disgusting how we have to, how they're living. Um, I'm also finding out that every food bank in my area is actually completely overwhelmed at the moment. So I really welcome this. Uh, and, and I do also welcome the fact that the uh, peoples and families should have a scrutiny, uh, task and finish on this to find out, uh, to create a task and finish, to scrutinise how to maximise opportunity for young people in Essex. Because at the end of the day, these young people living in my area are my are our future of, of tendering. And unless we sort this out, we're not going to have a major problem with that when they grow up because there's nothing here at the moment. All there is, all I'm seeing is poverty, poverty, poverty down my way. And this needs to be sorted out. Um, the other thing I would like to mention, uh, and I don't like mentioning it, but I will mention it. When it when someone comes up with it's political, this is not political. I don't see any of that Labour motion political. It is actually, I think it's um, disrespectful to the people of my area to say that sort of um, amendment is, is political, um, because that's not. Um, and the schools, sorry, the schools, the schools are doing a fantastic job. We have a food bank in one of the schools, uh, Coastal Academy, it's doing a fantastic job. But again, it's overwhelmed. And I'd imagine all the other schools in Clapton have been overwhelmed as well. We need to sort this out. As I said before, the children of Essex are our future. If we don't help them and sort this out, what future do we have? Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Wood. And we will continue this debate to its conclusion before we take a break. Councillor Julie Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As our motion states, we face the biggest economic crisis since the 1930s. I wanted to refer, refer to some real life cases. And I'm sure across this chamber, there are numerous other examples. During the past week, these are three of the women who've been in touch with me for help. One woman's house has burnt down. Her family are in temporary accommodation. She needs a three bedroom house. The expected wait for um, one in, from Colchester Borough Homes is two to three years. Another, a beauty therapist, having had no work for the past nine months, the debt's mounting, the rent on premises still owing, she's having to sell her home and move on because to sort out the financial mess she finds herself in. The third woman, a single parent, works as a cleaner. Hours have been cut, with two family members died this year. She's got funeral costs to repay and she's desperate and she doesn't have enough food to feed her family. I remember questioning the need for a food bank in Colchester when I was originally set up in 2008. 
After all, Labour then in power had an objective to end child poverty, so surely this wasn't going to be needed. Over a decade later, we see the exponential rise in food banks across Essex. In Colchester, the food bank has seen a 34% increase in use. Little did I know how vital the one I opened in Greenstead in 2019 was going to be. It has proved a lifeline. Like many of my Labour colleagues in Colchester, during the half-time holiday, I stepped up and helped a charitable group go for to deliver food parcels to 30 families in my division. And on the 21st of December, I'll be out with Les Nickel to shop for Christmas hamper food for the needy families. But is this really what this country has come to? Good-hearted people running around with supermarkets, fair share schemes, with yesterday's food in carrier bags for the poor. While I welcome the administration's recent financial support for needy, the needy during COVID, Mr Chairman, the poverty that we see isn't the result of COVID. It's come from a decade of cuts which have hit women and children the hardest. As a trustee of First Seat, I see the value that their holiday hunger programme brings. This isn't just about the food, it is about the social element of bringing families together. That is so vital and no doubt alleviates the despair. 14% of children in Colchester are living in low-income households. Our motion states we must resource the organisations that are meeting this need. Mr Chairman, Councillor Madden often gets frustrated with the Labour group for our references to the closures of children's centres. We saw over 80 across Essex dwindle down to just 12. We were told that going forward it was to be a service without walls. Well, it's time we look to see just how much service is left. With a 30% cut in funding in North Essex and the need to for virgin shareholders, to, we need an urgent review that, to see what service is being provided to families that Thank end you, up having to rely on charity. Thank you. Mr Chairman, in the earlier motions, it was really helpful to have, see the countdown. So could that be put up? Countdown? On time? Yeah. We, um, yeah. Um, I think we might... Is that, is that, Oh, it is there. You're just going to move your top header along. It'll, it'll show. Sorry, Thank you Councilor. very much. It's all right. These simple things. Now, I'd, I'd really like to ask Councillor Baker, who suddenly burst on the screen in a volume of sound, <laughs> not to try and try and not do that again, if he could. Um, right. Our next speaker is Councillor Davies. No apologise for that, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I hope you can hear me. Um, I support the motion before us, which is primarily aimed at tackling inequality and with children and young people being brought sharply into focus. COVID-19 has shown that there are inequalities in Essex. And in addition, it has brought about an economic crisis nationally with huge national debt. People, our residents, are struggling with day-to-day -day living. Jobs are under threat, and I feel it is our duty to help do all we can to ensure children and young people are protected during this time. The motion sends thanks to Marcus Rashford for highlighting the need for free school meals to continue across school holidays. The council also thanks, gives thanks to all the organisations through this motion that helped provide that service recently. And we can learn from this example. However, the holiday activity and meals needs to be continued to be resourced to reach a disadvantage wherever they may be. Without question, this should be fully endorsed and financed. I trust that all members agree that this is a priority. Some children receive less food during school holidays due to being in poverty. And in a civilised society, this must not allow to be continued anymore, anywhere. With youth unemployment high, the prospects uncertain, it's important that we do all we can to provide secure safe zones for young people to flourish in their skills and talents. Youth zones in our districts and boroughs will help create a, a space free from everyday pressures where young people will be allowed to express themselves to grow and have their needs supported. This environment may not be accessible in other sections of their lives due to various circumstances, but we can provide these opportunities if we have a collective will to do so. The second part of the motion asks for people and families policy and scrutiny committee to create a task and finish group to help maximise opportunity for young people. 
I think we can all agree that 2020 has not been a good year and young people leaving schools, colleges and universities have been greatly affected by the drastic drop in employment and skills opportunities. They need to gain the skills and experiences they need to work towards a better future. We as a council can help provide those opportunities by working with employers to provide career fairs, skills training, work experience and mentoring to name just a few examples. It's our suggestion and I hope we can agree upon that a dedicated task and finish group be convened to explore this route and initiate the way forward. Now, it's not escaped my attention that an amendment has been tabled which reduces the effectivity of all these points I've made. One point on the amendment states that the government has helped with disadvantage, but I have to point out they did not help provide free school meals during that half term. That literally does not make sense to add this part. So in the current point, let's reject the amendment, reject the amendment, support this motion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Okay. Today. I'll now call on Councillor Pat Reid. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I also um, would like to support this motion before us, and I would also like to thank Marcus Rashford, who used his own experiences of growing up to help others during this year of COVID. Um, between 500 to a thousand sure start centres closed in England since 2010, and some of these were in the poorest and most deprived areas. The charity Action for Children estimates that 1.8 million children use sure start centres in England in 2017 to 2018. The figures were down from 2.2 million four years earlier, and this was a direct consequence, it says. Um, of a 62% cut in council spending since 2010. It is not even the fact so much that Sure Start uh, centres were shut and a private firm, Virgin Care, took over the control. The whole concept of why Sure Start was there in the first place was lost. Virgin Care did not replace what Sure Start provided for many people. These centres allowed them to come together in a friendly and informal way. They gained confidence, parenting skills, cooking skills and many other skills as well. They gained confidence in mixing with others and instead of feeling isolated and lonely, they were energized and developed good friendships along the way. These skills which carry you through life, these are skills which carry you through life. Once you realize you are not alone, it builds on your self-confidence and self-esteem, making you feel a more worthwhile person and then allows you and encourages you to help others. This was a very important part of the Sure Start Centres because you could just go along, you were not judged. Everything was done at your own pace and once you felt comfortable, you could then join in and become part of a bigger picture. This is what we lost and it's an important part of what um, these isolated and lonely and um, deprived areas need. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll now move on and call Councillor Kerry Smith. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd better declare an interest, and I think all of the Basildon and two actors might, because we're going to do the first youth zone in the whole county, and it happens to be in Wesley Heights. And as an elected member for Wesley Heights, I've had scores of people come on to me and go, this must be an election ploy. We don't see sort of eight million pounds of investment. I said, I can assure you, as deputy leader of the council, we are going to do this shoe So they are really good. I mean, I want to talk about the positives about this. We're just talking about the positive. I mean, according to the Basildon and Echo online today, and all members can look, it says the plans include a four court indoor sports hall, indoor climbing hall, fitness suite, combining state of the art gym equipment with boxing, martial arts facilities a performing studio, a boxing, a martial arts and gym and much more. This isn't about entertaining for children, it's about getting them healthier. I think the administration should be going, yes, Basildon, you do your youth so. We're going to watch everything you're doing, see if there's anything we can get better and roll it out across the county. They're fantastic things. And for the cost of the council match funded at 4.1 million at Basildon, we see that as value for money. Because if we have a healthy youth 
we have a healthy work future workforce. And a healthy future workforce means more productivity. People have a better standard, social mobility. I hope all members of this council support this motion. It's a really good thing. It's a pity about the amendment. And I think what Marcus Rashford done, as well with his work, is fantastic. I'm not a football person. We all see these footballers and their so-called wives and all the sort of glory, unglory details we see. And what Marcus Rashford's done is a, is a very sportsman-like thing. Didn't make it political. He took an issue on, which a lot of his fans felt was very important. And he made a positive. The government listened. So I think we should all wholeheartedly support it. And I hope once we've got the battle of the news, so that, you know, back to the first brick, Mr. Chairman, you might come down as well. It's going to be a great thing. Best ever. Really good. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Smith. And I have as, as, as three more speakers, Councillor Button, Councillor Chandler and Councillor Sheldon. I'm not sure whether Councillor Harris's hand is just up permanently all the time. I've forgotten to take it down. I will ask advice on that later. Councillor Butland. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, COVID-19 hasn't exposed the huge inequalities. They have been there and have been there for a number of years. There are some of us who 20 years ago uh, in another uh, occupation worked very hard within the health service in South Essex to tackle health inequalities, particularly then with the Labour Secretary of State, Alan Milburn, who I remember coming to visit us to talk about how in those days he could get local government and the NHS to work more collectively on tackling these joint issues. Health inequalities chairman were there in that time. Alan Johnson, the then Secretary of State in 2008, set up a review, it was called the Marmot Review still an absolutely essential document on health inequalities. It highlighted what it called the social, gra gra social gradient of health inequalities, which basically where one is in the social and economic status de defines your health status. The, the richer you are, the healthier you will be. But that is an issue which no one party can claim to have a conscience, a social conscience on health inequality. It is an issue which confronts all of us. I congratulate the Conservative government on bringing public health into local government because the activities of local government actually cover all of the issues that affect uh, health inequalities. So namely housing, education, social isolation, disability, those are the issues that need to be done. I read with interest, Chairman, a follow-up report which was published in February of this year on the Marmot in, uh, Review. And two things stuck out, came out for me very seriously. And I hope if we set up, and I think we should set up a uh, working group to look at it, but it said focusing solely on the most disadvantageous will not reduce health inequalities sufficiently. To reduce the steepness of, social, of the social gradient in health, actions must be universal. And I think that's an important thing. And the other thing which links in with what this council is doing, tackling social inequalities in health and tackling climate change must go together. The two are inextricably linked. And I think that is something which this council has a, an ideal opportunity to do given it the, um, the work that it's been doing on climate change as well. So as far as the motion is concerned, um, it is easy to point to individual uh, examples. It is a, an issue which has confronted governments of all colours for 20 to 30 years. And I am not claiming that the Conservative Party is the only party that can deal with it. And I trust other members will recognise that their party does not have a God-given right on this issue. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Butland. Um, I have Councillor Aspinall on the line, so I'll take him next. Councillor Aspinall. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dewitt, as to the debate, I am forced to make a declaration of interest. As a 31-year-old uh, holder of a season ticket at Old Trafford, you can imagine how proud I am 
of what Marcus has achieved, but also I contribute to his wages. So as a matter of declaration of interest, you have it, but also be aware his next campaign is on uh, mental health issues for young people backed up by the Manchester United Foundation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Barry. Thank you, Councillor Aspinall. Right, we'll now, I'll now call Councillor Chandler, then Councillor Sheldon, and then we'll work out whether Councillor Harris is a permanent or a wisher. Councillor Chandler. Thank you, Chairman. I will be brief. As Chairman of the People and Families Policy and Scrutiny Committee, I wish to respond to point two of the Labour motion, which calls upon the People and Families Policy and Scrutiny Committee to create a task and finish group with the role of scrutinising how to maximise an opportunity for young people across Essex. Members of the People and Families Policy and Scrutiny Committee, I am sure, would welcome exploring any ways to improve the lives and opportunities for all our residents, young and old. However, I think we need to take two things into consideration. Firstly, the remit, as stated in the motion, is very broad and it may well need the involvement of more than one scrutiny committee to achieve the best result. Secondly, with only three more meetings of the People and Families Policy and Scrutiny Committee left during this administration, and with a full work programme and a task and finish group on domiciliary care currently underway, any new task and finish group runs the risk of being rushed and incomplete. With this in mind, I would respectfully suggest that the establishment of a task and finish group as proposed would be better considered by the members of the People and Families Policy and Scrutiny Committee in conjunction with other scrutiny committees, if appropriate, post May. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor uh, um, I'll now call on Councillor Sheldon. Um, I've another two speakers. Councillor Sheldon. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. I personally agree with the Labour motion about the scale of the challenge, <coughs> and I think most members do. We will hopefully win the war against COVID in the next few months, but I'm concerned we'll lose the peace unless we build upon the good work we've already done to support our communities and those in need through the economic shifts we're currently experiencing and the ones that we know are still yet to come. I also salute Marcus Rashford, MP, and indeed all of those who seek to put holiday hunger at the forefront of the public debate, something that us as politicians really can't speak about enough. I want to tackle something head on though, and that is free school meals. Now I agree wholeheartedly that holiday hunger is an issue that needs to be tackled. For me, free school meals isn't the casual solution, because a child that is hungry on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, of course, will also be hungry on Saturday and on Sunday within those holidays. And that's something that actually us and our Hamper Programme at Essex County Council have sought to tackle head on. Um, what I also disagree with about the motion is that it asks us as a county council to do several things that we are already doing. And I've heard no evidence presented to say that they weren't done effectively and they didn't have the effect that it was intended. Mr Chairman, I went and had the privilege of visiting some of those holiday hunger activity camps. Indeed, uh, I had the privilege of visiting the one in Harwich Art Centre. And I challenge anybody to ask the parents of those children, that, uh, ask the parents of those children to say that those camps weren't effective in precisely doing that and getting those children out and active and by providing food at those camps doing exactly what they're intended to do and tackle holiday hunger head on. Mr Chairman, our Essex County Council officers, our policy makers, and indeed the community groups and contractors we worked with have worked incredibly hard to tackle holiday hunger of the previous holidays and are gearing up to do even more in the holidays to come. And Mr Chairman, the Labour motion as it stands simply doesn't do enough to thank them or indeed recognise that work. I also want to tackle briefly, if I can, the concept of youth zones and actually talk about, first and foremost, the good work that's been done not just basic county council youth workers, but also those community organisations that have gone out there and supported our young people um, throughout the entirety of the lockdown and indeed since then. Mr Chairman, I'm concerned that if we were to put forward a youth zone rollout, 
that the good work that those organisations are already doing would be neglected, when actually a lot of those organisations, through the passion they have for their community, are seeking to tackle those issues head on. And I believe, Mr Chairman, that we should do what we can to support those organisations, those communities, those charities out there doing that good work now, rather than seeking to reinvent the wheel. I also do have concerns about um, the uh, geographic issues as well. There is need all across our county. Because the motion fails to mention the hard work done to tackle the issues it raises, because when it comes Mr. to... Sheldon, wind up, please. Opportunity, ...one size fits all, I hereby support the amendment and urge others to do so. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Sheldon. Now, um, I must ask Councillor Harris, because his hand has been up for the whole meeting, do you wish to speak on this, or have you just forgotten your... No, no, Mr Chair, I definitely do um, wish to speak on this, please, Mr Chair. Because, uh, Councillor Harris, we do have lists, you see, and you're normally through your group, and it allows us to make this work very well, but there is some element of flexibility. So, right, your chance to speak. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, these, um, my remarks really... Uh, some of the speakers. Um, for me, I'm speaking on the motion as proposed by Councillor Scordis. Um, I support the doing things that are on the shopping list of cabinet. So that hasn't been mentioned, the, the doing things, and that's been amended out. Um, those doing things, I want to support wholeheartedly, and I want to try, concentrate on a couple of things that have been said. First, I want to look at back at the, um, I just want to mention the past budgets. Uh, where the, the council was forced by austerity to cut a lot from the youth budget. And now here in my area, Mr Chairman, we used to have a professional team of youth workers, and they were very good as well, going round with the young people, with the youth bus, um, and engaging with young people in a safeguarding way and inspiring them to do things in their community. The cuts over that time of austerity have meant that the community had to rally round and set up its own youth club with grant aid and volunteers. Now that's what this motion is talking about. The, the people in communities doing it for themselves and, and plugging the inequality gap. Now Councillor Scord has referred to, Mr Chairman, in the community, uh, the kindness that's there. The volunteer work in the youth club in my area is exactly that sort of kindness that he refers to. Um, then, as to the holiday hunger, uh, I was a founder member of the Monkwick Munch Club with some volunteers. Uh, again, more kindness, uh, and those inequalities uh, were there and were there before uh, COVID, and they're polarised by COVID, as we all know in this in this meeting today. Um, for me, um, it's about not about politics in that room where we were plugging the gap with holiday hunger. It's about making do and making the best of what we can do ourselves. Now, COVID has destroyed some of that and people are desperate, Mr Chairman, desperate, hardworking families I've seen in the last few months struggling to make ends meet that would never, ever uh, uh, in recipients of any help at all. They were donors to the food banks, uh, sitting back and watching a help and volunteer. No, they're being volunteered for. They're being given because that's what the problem is. Um, for me, I'm supporting the original motion. That's what I'm doing. I'm sorry I've got to say that. I don't support the amendment and I support the council scorers and council Henderson in what they're trying to do here. Thank you for allowing me to speak, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Harris, as if I wouldn't. <laughs> We're going to wind up the debate and that means that Councillor Madden has a chance to speak as the second of the amendment. How long do I have? Uh, hmm? Three minutes you have, Councillor. Yeah. Uh, then, thank you, Chairman. I'll go straight into this then. From the point of view of it's been said, inequality does exist in our county. We know that, and it is important that we address it. Hence, what we said about need for levelling up through the continued and targeted support of our, for our most vulnerable residents and communities. Our success as an administration um, members has been of very much about early intervention. I hear the voices on the other side of the chamber talking about um, in their amendment, they talk about that, uh, uh, that uh, where is it? Over the past 10 years of cuts to public services. I go back to what I've said before. 
Why were those austerity brought in? Because the Labour government and the events that went on there. It's because of the way that we've worked, thinking of lower cost and better services, we end up with a youth service that does get to more vulnerable people than it did before when it was in buildings. We've got children's services, that, which is outstanding. We have a holiday hunger programme, which I'll come back to, that has been uh, very productive. We have an Essex Child and Welfare Wellbeing Service, um, a service without walls, as Councillor Young reminded me, of our strap line, which again is delivering more to vulnerable people than it was before, than it, early years was before. And as recently, Chairman received another award, a national and a, a local award. With regard to um, Marcus Rashford, I think it is important that we acknowledge, and it has been acknowledged nationally with the uh, award of the MBE uh, and that what he has raised the profile nationally of hunger but just let me remind you members however to be clear Councillor Lewis McKinley and officers introduced holiday home activity session which were targeted for the most vulnerable families in 2019. In February this year to all of us she made an announcement that summer camps would be held again across Essex with food for working families and those of the most vulnerable and not only over Christmas but in Easter half term. She also announced to all of you about 2.175 million in vouchers for free school meals for use over Christmas holiday, uh, over Christmas holiday and February half term. The difference of the two uh, motions is Essex has for some years now developed early intervention and addressing inequalities and providing better services for value for money than it has ever done before. However, I acknowledge, we all acknowledge, there are continues to be inequalities. And I think the conclusion of our amendment, which is the same as the Labour amendment, is we should, we should refer to the people and families committee to create the task and finish, subject to what obviously uh, the chairman had said, uh, Councillor, uh, uh, Councillor Chardler, because we as all members should look at inequality and as a joint group on that committee, we can actually go forward as well. I recommend the amendment motion, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Madden. Um, Councillor Henderson, you have the right of reply. You have three minutes. Chairman, I speak on the Labour motion and against the, the amendment. Uh, Chairman, uh, uh, N Child Poverty published a report in 2018 revealing tender and child poverty, the highest in Essex. 8,884 children living in poverty. Harridge and Parkston particularly affected by 1,461 of those children and tender and overall with 3,056 children on free school meals. And I can't, for, for the life of me, um, understand the comments just made by Councillor Sheldon about five days people will be fed and perhaps two days they may not be. As someone who witnessed while I was younger being on free school meals, it was so important for parents to have that support for those five days when they're financially struggling uh, for those five days. To say that that's not the answer, it certainly is at the moment. And my concerns were raised mostly because of this and why we put that in there about Essex perhaps having an investigation into the way that Virgin Care is delivering the service is because of the facts that I found out when the portfolio holder was actually providing the hunger holiday program for October. It actually, she actually came back to me with an email saying that they could not find any referrals in Harwich to actually go on that program. I asked her again in another email and I had another reply that there was no referrals for that program. So then I went to my voluntary sector um, groups who told me that it's unprecedented the actual increase they've had in referrals into their groups, both Homestar and the Art Centre in Harwich. They said actually they hadn't got the opportunity to send their children on those schemes to have those hot meals that those families were more than pleased to have a sandwich that they provided. 
So something in the system is wrong. And I find it really worrying today to hear the Conservatives not wanting to be open and transparent, not wanting to be scrutinised, but to cover things up. Because that's what's happening. We've already had a situation where we've recognised that we have missing children in Essex. And actually, we've sent a report to the government. We've got the same issue with missing families and young children, naught to five. We need to do the same, look, look at the same magnifying glass on those families to find out why they're not being sorted. We closed our children's centres and you cut that budget by 30% in North Essex. That's why deprivation has gone up over the last five years. Our deprivation in Harwich or Tendron has gone up from, since 2010. By <laughs> you should be open to scrutiny. You should be aware, make yourself aware of what your failings are, Mr Chairman. And I, I regret this, this moment that Essex are not prepared to look at providing a better service for those children and families that need it. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Right, that is the debate wound up, and we will now go to the vote, which will mean that we will put the Conservative amendment yeah. to the vote. Right, the system will come up on your screens. And I need to, at the same time, ask uh, Councillor Spence and Councillor Aspinall. Councillor Spence. Voting for the amendment, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Aspinall. Uh, voting against the amendment, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Aspinall. We'll wait a moment for the votes to come through. Joanna Bull is just handing them to me. And for the Conservative Amendment, the votes are as follows. For 48, against 15, abstentions 4. Therefore, the amendment becomes now the substantive motion. So, uh, Chairman, Chairman sorry, I didn't press the submit button, so that was another one against. <laughs> Unfortunately, Evan, it's been voted on, but I think we would ex not expect anything else than that. And it's a new system. We will get used to it. I think actually it's working extremely well. Um, but there is a bit of a time. We'll give it a bit more, a few more seconds. Right. Now, I'll now put the substantive motion, which is the original motion as amended, to the vote. And here it comes on the screen. Councillor Spence, you'll vote for the amended motion, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Aspinall? Reluctantly going to have to agree to it, Chairman. <laughs> uh, thank you, Barry. Thank you, Councillor Aspinall. I'll just submit mine. Councillor Henderson, have you had time to do press the right button? We'll take it to the hands. And I'll just wait for Councillor Mrs. Bowler to uh, bring me the results. She's rapidly writing them down. Thank you. And the result of that vote was 458 against 3 and abstain. Eight, and therefore the amendment, which became a substantive motion, is uh, succeeds. Well, now I'm going to call for a no point of order, Chairman. Councillor Bowen, yes. I, I think we should just reflect. We've we've been discussing a motion on inequality, and we have today a system which is not equal, in that those two councillors with disabilities have to be open about which way they voted whilst the rest of us have hidden behind a button on a screen. Not for today, but could you give consideration, Chairman? 
to an equal approach to all councillors. It's a very good it is a very good point you make, Councillor Butland, and I cannot wait till we get back into the chamber where everything will be crystal clear. Now, before we go, I, I've had a note from Abbot Hugh, and he wishes to convey his apologies for a very good and rather sad reason that he was called out to a dying parishioner this morning, a very difficult one, and it went longer than anticipated. So, you know, our thoughts are with him, and it's very kind of him to let us know. Right, members, we've got through half of the motions, and we'll now take a 10-minute break. So if we come back at 12.20... I'll see you then. Are you still there, Joanna? Harry, Joanna's screen is frozen, so she'll get All right. as soon as possible. I am still don't, here. Yeah, don't disconnect me. <laughs> I'm going to stay around for 10 minutes. I won't, don't worry. <laughs> and can I pray, can I give congratulations to you, the other officers and the chairman for vastly improving the, the voting uh, today as opposed to the last time we went through this. Phenomenal. Thank you. Thanks, Barry. That was that was Cheers. really useful, Barry, to know that it's worked. Yeah, it's been it's been really, really good. Thank you. Thanks.
I'll start. Right, members. Um, I hope you've enjoyed your 10 minute relaxation. I can see Councillor Jackson looking overjoyed. And um, we'll now move on to motion number three. And it's uh, the Essex County Council support for residents and businesses. And I will call Councillor McKinley to move the motion. And she'll just, it will be a formal proposal of the motion. Councillor McKinley. Thank you, Chairman. I move the motion as outlined in the report. Thank you very much. And I'll now ask Councillor Ball, Tony Ball, to confirm the motion is seconded and let me know if he wishes to reserve. Emily says second, uh, Mr Chairman, and reserve my right to speak. Thank you very much, Councillor Ball. Right, I'll now call on the mover of the motion, Councillor McKinley, to speak to the motion, and Councillor McKinley, you will have five minutes to do so. Thank you, Chairman. So, Chairman, we meet today um, on what is a, a historic date, because it is, of course, the, the day that the first vaccine has been administered to people um, in terms of the Pfizer BioNTech, and that's obviously in relevance to the first across the world. But we shouldn't uh, lose sight of the fact that, as welcome as that is, that the challenges that many of our most vulnerable families are facing are far from over. And as we move more deeply into the winter, those challenges are only going to get more acute. Over the last few weeks, I have shared with members details of support packages that have gone out and are going out across the county. Uh, in, in some cases, they have been very targeted, in others, more general. So the food bank funding that we have given is enabling food banks and associated organisations to continue to provide packages of support to families across Essex. We announced the £100,000 that's going into Homestart to support those most vulnerable families in the to five, with children in the 0 to 5 category. We're, we're supporting grassroots organisations via the District Council, giving them some funding to enable them to provide money to some of those really key groups within their local areas. More money for addiction and alcohol dependency. And of course, the £2.175 million that will go to families who are in receipt of free school meals based on their household income. And what that means in reality, uh, Chairman, is that a family with two children who receive free school meals will receive vouchers over Christmas worth £60, £15 per child per week. So what we are doing is, is very substantial and unprecedented in what is clearly a very unique time that we are living in. It goes beyond just what we are doing in the here and now. And as we heard in the last motion, there has been a lot of work that has taken place up until now. So we know that we have seen um, very popular activity camps, very worthwhile holiday hunger uh, support that started last year, long before COVID. We also know that the summer camps that took place with a big focus on childcare were very welcomed by families across the county as they tried to return to work after that period of lockdown. And we are intending to not only continue with them, but actually expand and increase the scope um, in terms of the geography across the county. But Chairman, we know that 2020 has to be about more than just getting to the end of the year. We have to look at some of the opportunities that are on offer for us now. And in some cases, that's about bringing people together. In others, it's about raising profiles. So we know just how fantastic some of our local organisations have been, how they've come together and really worked to the benefit of their local people. We need to build resilience. We need to build sustainability. And we need to make sure that those community groups continue to feel supported and that they will be able to take the work that they're doing now into the future for the benefit of local people. The Essex Welfare Service, the Essex Coronavirus Action, the Working Families with Children Facebook page, these have all been grown uh, very recently and are enabling people to really use their own contacts and their own communities to better their circumstances. We know through the, through the childcare initiatives that we're looking at in the Working Families Programme that there are opportunities there for us to be able to support families as we move into next year. And I expect to be coming back and sharing more details of that with you in the first quarter of 2021. 
The tendering project, which I launched earlier this year and which we have made sure we are not allowing to, to, to slip despite the other challenges. And indeed, I mentioned it at the scrutiny committee yesterday that I attended. That project is seeing £600,000 be invested in tendering to identify new ways in which we can support families, looking at parents as people to make sure that we can give them the tools that they need to live those very flourishing lives to the betterment of themselves, their families and their area. It's a new and exciting project and it's one which I'm hoping is going to really deliver benefits and which we can therefore take forward into other areas like Canvey Island to ensure that the legacy of some of these efforts and that the, the issues that we're facing today can actually be, in some cases, a positive one. And of course, the laptop scheme. We, we've spoken much this morning about life chances and it's the reality in today that so much goes on online and with the need, and the need for devices. And we know there are a number of children and students across the county who simply don't have access to that. So I very much welcome the announcement that the leader made in his speech today that Essex County Council will be funding 1,000 devices to enable um, the, the, that scheme to be kickstart um, at, to the betterment of, of um, young people who otherwise just wouldn't have access to those devices. So Chairman, I think there is a lot more that can be done and I'll just sum up very quickly by saying that the work that we are doing, that we have done to date, is just the springboard for more to come in the future. Thank you very much. I, I will uh, always have a little latitude in the cabinet members. I did miss out the fact that I should have asked the, were there any amendments, well there are none. So we'll move to the debate and I have, I'll give you the list, it's councillors Young, McCrory, Smith, Durham, Henderson, Sheldon, Wood, and Mercy. And that is it. Right, I'll call on Councillor Young. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is no saying a rising tide lifts all boats, and setting aside the human costs of living in poverty and the impact that has on individuals, this affects the economy and us all. The uplift of additional £20 on universal credit has been a great help, but this needs to carry on and not be stopped in April. Covid has brought many challenges, but it also brought opportunities to reset our thinking and to look at the economic model that we have followed throughout the 20th century into the 21st. As we speak, we see colossal giants such as the Arcadia Group fall away. We're losing Debenhams. We have lost Argos and Laura Ashley in Colchester and no doubt more will follow. Our high streets will change and we must navigate and respond to this. We've heard the voices of the hospitality sector, loud and clear, many will close for good. Our economy is built on a circular demand and supply basis. COVID has isolated people, shops and restaurants closed. With no demand, stocks remain unsold and the chain is broken. Adam Smith and Milton Friedman would accept the consequence and let the market fall away. Are we going to do this? Is it in our interest to do so, economically or morally? We have driven towards the goal of economic growth and GDP our entire lives, and COVID has come along, thrown the deck of cards in the air. Man thought he was all powerful, but nature has fought back. We see the vaccine as a solution, and of course is welcome. But what this episode has driven home more than anything else is that as individuals, we are not an island. For some people going out of the house stopped in March and the impact of this has been immense, both physically and mentally. Our doors closed at the first lockdown, they haven't opened since. But for others, NHS workers, teachers, carers, our frontline workers, this hasn't been possible. We depend on these people for our existence. They have had to put their own well-being at jeopardy to keep the country going. For others, COVID has brought benefits of working from home, leaving the commute behind, a better balance, a chance to empty the dishwasher, to see more of the kids. Dad's actually out and about with their children, spending time with them. Have you noticed? For some people, not working meant not earning. Not earning meant not eating and not paying the mortgage or the rent or the, and the domino consequences follow. As councils, we've been invited to be more commercial. But going forward, is that going to be the answer? I think the economic story has to change. The state's role must be rethought. The state must play a leading role in supporting the household and the market alike. First, by providing public goods that deliver to all. 
not just for those who can pay, so enabling its economy to thrive. We should support the caring role of the household, such as and paternal leave policies that empower both parents and investment in early years. Mr Chairman, I look forward to this work continuing in the authority, but I really think this is time to reset and rethink. Thank you, Councillor Young. I call Councillor McCrory. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to emphasise the huge contribution which has been made by the districts, boroughs and the city council in response to this pandemic. And I say this because reference is made in the motion in a, if I may say so, a somewhat cursory way to the assistance of our district colleagues. I would like to suggest that this assistance has been quite outstanding as all this workload has been accommodated on top of all the usual responsibilities that our councils have. For example, grants have been distributed to businesses expeditiously and efficiently with staff going over and above what we should expect. Staff have been re redeployed to help in the hubs, including in the food bank. Therefore, it is perverse indeed that the government has imposed a wage freeze on these very staff. This is no way to treat people. That said, Mr Chairman, the Liberal Democrat group will support the motion in the hope that the reference in bullets one, two and three of ensuring support, building resilience, and promoting and developing are not just words, but are translated into real actions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Corey. I'll now call Councillor Carrie Smith. If we can find him. Councillor Carrie Smith, are you there? Right, we'll move on to Councillor Mark Durham and we can always come back. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, this motion not only concerns our residents, but also businesses. Nobody can have foreseen how COVID-19 has changed things for nearly every person and business on the planet. In the UK, a few sectors have fared quite well, actually, but most have suffered to a greater or lesser extent. Unfortunately, many have not survived and thousands have only managed with the innovative and generous support measures provided by our Conservative government. Without these, many perfectly sound businesses would have failed and countless jobs lost forever. The furlough scheme alone has saved tens of thousands of valuable jobs across the UK. As Chairman of Visit Essex, the tourism and hospitality sector is dear to my heart and its importance to the Essex economy can't be underestimated. Normally, it contributes £3.5 billion to the Essex economy. It employs 69,000 people and is a significant national and local tax contributor. COVID has decimated this sector more than many others, and nationally, the lost revenue is in excess of £10.25 billion to date. In Essex, there have been a 25% drop in employment numbers, and hospitality businesses have reported that they've been running at about 56% of their normal capacity. Several businesses have closed permanently, and as at September, nearly 20% expressed concern about their long-term future. The wedding function and event businesses have probably suffered the most. Their much overlooked supply chain, for example, marquee hire firms, photographers, toilet hire and staging companies, to mention just a few, have lost almost all of their income since March. Essex County Council, its Economic Recovery Task Force, District, City and Borough Councils, Visit Essex and other partner organisations have been working tirelessly to support this sector with specially targeted grants, promotions and other initiatives such as the Great Days Out and Great Adventures Close to Home Scheme, which will help tourism venues to benefit from more local visitors in the future. We've engaged directly with businesses and carried out surveys to ascertain key facts that will assist us in targeting help to those in greatest need. 
traditionally January through March are the toughest for the tourism and hospitality sector and we're looking at ways to help them through these months until the prospect of better weather and the vaccine enable them to recoup some lost income. I've absolutely no doubt without the support of Essex County Council and its partners, many businesses would not survive and may not be in a position to take advantage of the change in circumstances we all hope for in 2021. We are not out of the woods yet. As someone greater and more eloquent than I once said, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it may be the end of the beginning. Chairman, this Conservative motion highlights the Council's recognition of issues, both post-lockdown and pre-vaccine. It demonstrates the commitment, both financially and politically, to enable Essex to move forward into the broad sunlit of a post-Covid world. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Durham. Well timed. Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I, I wanted to speak on this motion because I believe it, it's actually connected to the last. And what I feel is, unless the authorities prepared to deal with its failures of the past, it won't put, its, uh, put the future right. And, that, and on that issue, I, I talk about you need to deal with poverty and the, and the causes of poverty before you start solving some of these problems. And the motion talks about supporting families and um, and children and I recognize the issue about today that was mentioned about the computers but even on that issue if I talk to some of my families they're having to have people go around to their houses to actually top up their utility bills let alone provide internet facilities for computers that are given to them that's how bad things are if we don't accept that and recognize how bad things are for people out there and how tough it is, we're not going to be able to move on. And that's why I think the council needs to actually focus in on itself, to see where those failings have been, to see why over the last four or five years, deprivation levels across Essex in certain areas has increased. If we don't deal with that situation, we're not dealing with the problem. You can throw money at them and that's all welcome but you also need to actually deal with the issues around them. If you're gonna supply computers for young people, great. It offers them access and it offers them, offers them um, opportunity for the future. It offers, offers them jobs for the future. If they get those qualifications through at school. Council Butler mentioned earlier about how he worked years ago with, within a Labour government. He didn't just open chore start schools. We didn't just work with primary care trusts but we also opened an education action zone across my area. We dealt with the causes and the issues with those children. Vocational skills in schools to make sure they had the opportunity provided for them to actually move out of that poverty that they were actually stuck in. We're not doing any of that. You're just talking about what you're doing now. You're not talking about how you failed in the past. And unless you address those things, unless you focus on those things, we won't move on for some of those families. They will be the missing families and missing children of the future. We need to tackle that as soon as possible, those issues, because we only have one chance with those families. We'll lose those generations if we don't invest in them now, if we don't recognise how we're not delivering on what we should do with them. I've worked with lots of voluntary groups over the last few months. Parish Helps is a fantastic group supplying food, supplying transport, supplying, like I said, utility bills where families haven't got the, the money to carry on paying for their or even to cook food. We need to actually recognise what has failed in the past before we can move on. Yes, this money is welcome. Yes, it will like a whole. But unless we deal with the real issues, we won't be helping those families. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. Um, I gather Councillor Kerry Smith is back on online. Uh, Councillor Smith, I did call you, but I'll give you another chance. Thank you, Mr Chairman. My apologies, because I'm at the Basildon Centre and the new spin scooters are there and I wanted to have a chat with the guys while they were still there. I'm sure Councillor Bentley from the chair would be grateful for that. Um, uh, I'm going to support the amendment um, and the motion in the summer of 2013 when I first joined this council, and it seems so long ago, the summer of 2013, 
Uh, I take with a motion to bring about three school meals um, during the summer holidays. Okay, it's been adapted into holiday hunger programme, which I'm so grateful for. And I never would envisage that there would be any sort of programme to help disadvantaged children during the whole school holidays be able to obtain a, a hot meal or something. Some parents are very good, but in unfortunate circumstances, whereas other parents have different priorities and it uh, inflicts on the children. So, yes, I will be supporting the amendment and the motion because it's important to help the most disadvantaged people in our county. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Well, thank you very much, Councillor Smith. Now call Councillor Andrew Sheldon. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. It's the time of year when we start to see lists of things about the previous year appear on the internet and on television. And I think one of the uh, one of the things I know a lot of people look at are the buzzwords of the previous year. Of course, this year it's going to be things like COVID and lockdown. Mr Chairman, I think in Essex, one of our buzzwords has been and should continue to be share. I think when lockdown first, uh, when we first had the lockdown, I was amazed like many others, I think, about the the capacity of our communities for kindness. People were sharing their time, sharing in some cases, you know, their last, um, you know, particular food product because they couldn't get it from the supermarket, sharing nappies, sharing what they had with their communities. And it was wonderful to see they've built up frameworks of sharing within our communities that are still benefiting people today. And Mr Chairman, I think going forward, we have a responsibility as Essex County Councillors to continue that sharing, but to share the news of the opportunities that Essex County Council and that the government are putting forward to support our communities and to support our businesses. Indeed, us as um, county councillors, I am sure many of the others did, were out and about supporting small businesses during Small Business Saturday. And I think we should continue to, to do what we can to encourage the sharing of good reviews and good news about local businesses and um, about uh, what's going to be what support is going to be out there to continue to assist them um, uh, through uh, the later stages of, of lockdown and December. Mr Chairman, Essex County Council has presented a very bold and ambitious programme of uh, ways and means to support those vulnerable people in our society and indeed support those businesses. And it is incredibly important, Mr Chairman, that we as county councillors take responsibility to get that news out there. Councillor Henderson shared with us now on two occasions his, his I think, pleasure at the, um, and support for the increase in um, universal credit. And I'm very pleased to hear it. It would have been a bit nicer if that information was shared around uh, during, by Councillor Henderson and others during the free school meals debate. But there you are. Looking at my own community groups, when people were raised concerns about holiday hunger, I was very pleased to see sharing of... Um, of means and support where people can get, uh, you know, the various things they need for their family. Mr. So, Chairman, we are a community, I think, that has been improved uh, by sharing in recent years. I think we should continue that trend as Essex County Councillors and indeed within our wireless communities by supporting the sharing of those key messages and supporting the sharing of what we are doing to, to support communities and businesses and to share the means on our own social media of how that those businesses and those communities can gain support from the various grants and programmes and activities we've got going forward. Sharing all the way, Mr Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Sheldon. Just to make it quite clear, there is no amendment to this motion. I think it was mentioned earlier. Uh, there is not an amendment. Right. Um, the eponymous Councillor Andy Wood. Thank you, Chairman. I'm not as eloquent of talking as most of these people, but I will get over what I'm going to say to you. I'm really happy with the fact that the council in the third part or second paragraph yes. says council will ensure that there is support for residents, businesses, and families and children in great need. Again, that refers back to the other, the other, uh, the option two. So I'm really glad about that. But then the Conservative government decide to so instead of saying thank you to the NHS, the care homes, the schools. Uh, put a pay freeze on their, on, their, on their earnings. That's incredible. So I'm really glad, again, that you've put that in. And I really hope you push that because I don't see we've had in the NHS, 
the, the uh, schools and everyone has worked really hard and they don't deserve to have that sort of thing thrown at them. So please, please, would you then make sure that we actually support this and go forward and actually push for this pay freeze to be taken out, please. That is really important. Now, the other, the other option I've got is, is also schools. Now, uh, we're saying about the young children and the schools and everything, and yet I'm finding that academies are now cutting staff, which is incredible at this time of year and with COVID in, but they're cutting staff. So the children are going to be affected because there won't be the staff there to support the children, which is what we are supposed to be doing in, in everything on today. Support the children. Well, you look at the academies and find out they are cutting staff big time. That's, that's really got me my go to that bit has. And I'm hoping that uh, I've written to Councillor Gooding and I'm hoping that he can actually see sense and try and stop this from happening, please. Um, the other thing is, we're thinking about uh, growth, uh, economic growth. What are you tendering? We would have economic growth if you'd put a cap on the A120 so that it would link up with Harwich. As Harwich is now becoming a free port, that would bring a lot of business into the, the area. So, you know, to me, that's, a, that's, that's you know, you, you've got to do something like that. I know you're saying to me, you haven't got the money, you haven't got this, but in the day, if that brings growth into my area, if it brings jobs into my area, I'm going to push and push and push until this road gets done and Harwich brings in, you know, get Harwich on its feet again because it will bring massive, massive employment for my part of Essex. So I'm really, really would like that to happen. Another thing is I've been here eight years and I keep looking at these motions. I keep looking at all this. It looks like it's, I'm hoping it's not, but it looks like some of these motions are just talk. Nothing ever gets done. So this time, do these things that we're putting on paper rather than just put them to the back burner. Thank you, Councillor Wood. Thank you. I'll now call the final speaker in the open debate, Councillor Bob Massey. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that I intend to be brief. Um, <laughs> Over the last nine months, I, along with many of my colleagues, have rolled our sleeves up as we've served as volunteers to help the more vulnerable members of our community through the various lockdowns, not least delivering meals to the vulnerable and shielding. As the leader observed and Councillor McCrory, this council, our district, city and parish councils and our residents have responded well to and through this crisis. I don't think it's excessive to suggest that our great county has been bloodied by the virus and has demonstrated its resilience. This motion will, I believe, help us to come out of this tragic experience an even stronger and more resilient county. It's the county our residents deserve, and so I heartily support this motion. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Massey. You win the prize, probably a Christmas pudding for the shortest summary. Very good. Um, right, it, we, that's sort of winding up the debate, and to wind it up, I will ask Councillor Tony Ball uh, exercises right, right of reply and as all you will have three minutes thank you chairman and obviously i won't be able to cover all the points raised by colleagues but i, I, I do welcome generally the support that this motion seems to have got and i would like to congratulate councillor mckinley and her services um for the work that they've done and the work they're going to do to tackle inequalities and deprivation and children of families in the county I'd just like to um, remind Councillor Henderson that deprivation and inequality didn't start in 2010. Unfortunately, it's been with us a long time, but I think that what Councillor McKinley has set out, and along with the work that we're doing in my portfolio on, on the economy and with jobs and support for businesses, we're looking to try and intervene where, where we need to. Mr Chairman, I'd also like to associate myself with the leader's comments in thanking all the staff of the County Council. There's no doubt that there's been a, a wonderful effort. And to address Councillor McCrory's uh, comments, I would also include all local government staff in that. I said before that I haven't seen such excellent collaborative working uh, between local authorities in my 
over well over 20 years now um, in, in, in local government. But during the pandemic, there's no doubt that councillors and officers have stepped up the plate. Chairman, I'd just like to highlight a few things that we have been doing within the economic development portfolio and then some that we, we're going to be doing in the future. So, as I said, we work with the district, cities, boroughs, we've held business round tables and actively engaged with the umbrella organisations such as the Chambers of Commerce, Institute of Directors and Federation of Small Businesses. Firstly, when we moved into Tier 2, then on the impl implementation of national restrictions, and then when we move back to tier two again, we've carried out a survey of 800 businesses. And actually one clear message, and this is something I think, again, perhaps probably can take back to the district, is that the businesses want clear advice and access to grants, and for it to be as simple to navigate as possible. And I just think that's something, that, that was their main demand. And I think we all in local government need to step up, up, step up on that. As you know, we've worked together on the grants. At the last council meeting, the leader um, set out and allocated uh, some funds for economic recovery, 5 million, and of course, the 100 million uh, commercial investment fund. So although we're hoping, and again, Councillor Young uh, mentioned this, and of course, the, the problems with the high street actually unfortunately do predate COVID, but there's been no doubt that COVID has accelerated the decline of some, of, of some businesses. We are hoping, um, safely of course, that our high streets will be able to, and, and hospitality we'll see through December, but also we're looking at January, uh, from January to March and sooner. Chairman, in conclusion, um, I'd just like to highlight both in my portfolio and Councillor McKinley's, but across the whole, whole council, lots has been done, no doubt more to do, but on behalf of this administration, but with the com commitment we will continue to support our residents, residents and businesses. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Ball. Right, that um, finishes the debate. And we, since there is no amendment, I'll repeat that, and we will go to the vote. And it, of course, is a substantive motion. So are you all ready on your buttons? We will go to the vote. And just for Councillor Button's uh, benefit, I am going to abstain. And now, could I ask Councillor Spence what your vote is? Uh, Chairman, I will be voting for the motion. And could I just say, Chairman, I was approached and agreed to this methodology of voting. Thank you very much. And Councillor Aspinall. Councillor Aspinall is for and can I commend this approach to voting. Thank you very much, Councillor Aspinall. And very shortly, we will have the result. And just for your information, members, while we wait, County Hall is actually warm for the first time in living memory. Thank you. <laughs> right, the result of the vote is for 64, against nil, abstain five, which includes me and probably Vice Chairman Johnson. Just to make sure the buttons are yes, absolutely. Johnson has said, yeah, that's true. Right. Now, we are approaching one o'clock, and I did say we'd have 15 minutes, but would you like to carry on and get rid of the motions? Not get rid of the motions. Fully debate these magnificent motions. And I would like some kind of indication, um, sort of, I put the question to you, would you like to carry on, if you would, put your hand up in the hand up side? Hand up side. Participants up. I can't do the hands up, but you've heard what me saying this. I, I'm seeing a vast number of hands coming up. I think it's probably going to be easier for those who disagree. Now, can you all take your hands down? I think I might have confused the issue there somewhat. Those who disagree is, is what we're looking for. Well, they're disappearing rapidly. Right. We uh, have something like 74 and three who disagree. So I think we'll press on to the next motion and then we'll review the situation then. Righto. 
Right, motion number four, which is acknowledging an acknowledgement to the response to COVID-19. Um, I'll call on the proposer, that's Councillor John Spence, to move the motion, which he will do so, but I ask him will not make, well, he will not make a speech at this point. Councillor Spence, would you like to move the motion? He's still mute, Chairman. He's still mute. Be a slight problem. That's right. Someone's coming in now to try and do it. Then. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Apologies, Chair. Apologies, Chairman. I will move and defer. Thank you very much, Councillor Spence. And I'll now ask Councillor Jeff Henry to confirm that the motion is second. Thank you, Chairman. I confirm that I um, second the motion and will defer speaking to later. Thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I now have to ask, are there any amendments to the motions? Yes, there are. One amendment has been received from the Labour group, proposed by Councillor Julie Young and seconded by Councillor Pat Reid. Councillor Young, would you like to formally propose the amendment? And I was thank you for um, I formally propose the amendment and reserve my right to speak later. Thank you, Councillor Young. <laughs> Councillor Reid, um, and indicate, you know, can you second the amendment and indicate whether you want to speak now or reserve until later? I second and reserve, please. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Right, I'll call on the mover of the motion, Councillor John Spence, to speak to it. And he will have um, five minutes to do so, but I think that Councillor Spence um, would wish to call upon members for a certain measure. Councillor Pence, would you like to, to, to indicate a good thing? Thank you, Chairman. And it would feel appropriate to open this debate by pausing to remember those thousands of Essex residents who have died from or because of the COVID-19 virus during 2021. I invite members to join me in a moment of reflection. And it is against that backdrop that our staff have worked, the backdrop of virus, of infection, of disease, illness at home and among colleagues, and sadly death. Across the council, staff have had to adopt new roles, adapt to new ways of working, moving to shift patterns, working facing risks themselves. And that is why we owe this formal note of thanks to all the staff of this council, the staff of our partners, the volunteers who have stepped up in their thousands, and all the residents of Essex for their forbearance and resilience. But Chairman, this motion is not about reflecting too much on the past, it is about looking to the future, because the proper response of the health and adult social care function is to build a better function for the future and as it's about this, that is why one reason why I will resist the amendment. COVID must not be allowed to defeat ambition. On the wider determinants of health, we will work with partners, understanding that the quantity and quality of employment are critical to removing deprivation through the, and thus a healthy and skilled workforce are a competitive workforce. We will continue to push for government employment and tendering and collecting. It is not being a nanny state to seek to educate and help families avoid the scourge of diabetes through the way in which they live. And we need to work with communities and employers and schools to identify those with things like anxiety and depression to prevent them from becoming serious mental illness and moving to crisis. On the quality of life, we will work with those with physical and sensory disabilities, with those with learning disabilities through the Meaningful Lives Matter programme, with the elderly and frail, working to ensure that we have all the mechanisms for them, that we can develop independent supported living pieces, we can ensure they are leaving hospital in the best possible pathways, that we have the technology in place that will enable them to live the independent life and having the quality of life that they wish. And finally, of course, we shall continue to work with the market so that those who do need care and support from us 
know that we have the quantity and quality of care in the places where it is needed. Mr Chairman, this council is well known for its financial probity, its efficiency and its effectiveness. We have a great children's service. We have a country leading climate commission. Our roads are far in excess in quality of where they used to be. In our two senior officers, the Director of Public Health and the Director of Adult Social Care, we have two guys who are well known throughout the country and highly respected. My deputies and I will be working to support them and their teams as we take forward a health and adult social care function, which is already very good, but moving it into a place of greatness so that our residents don't just have the quality of service they deserve, they have one of which they can boast. Achievement will defeat COVID-19. I'd like to move. Thank you, Councillor Spence. Um, I'll now ask Councillor Young to make a speech of up to three minutes in support of the amendment. Thank you, Mr Chairman. The, the motion rightly praises the efforts of our staff who have worked alongside our heroic volunteers during the most difficult period most of us have experienced in our lifetime. But Mr Chairman, warm words, though welcome, do not put meals in our families' mouths or heat our homes and our staff deserve better. In the autumn statement, Ricky Sunak wrongly stated that pay has been rising faster in the public sector than the private sector. A recent Office for National Statistics study that compared jobs on a like-for-like -like basis found that the average public sector worker was paid 3% less than the private sector worker in 2019 and had been earning less in terms of gross pay, including overtime and bonus pay, every year since 2014. Public sector workers faced a pay freeze, and when inflation is taken into account, a pay freeze is actually a pay cut. This is because the cost of living increases whilst wages fall behind. If rent, food and petrol costs are rising whilst wages are frozen, workers lose out. The Chancellor has stated those not working for the NHS who earn less than 24,000 medium will get a pay rise of at least 250 pounds. Members in local government and schools will be familiar with those promises of a flat rate boost for the lowest paid. Historically, they have often failed to materialise, with payments often left to the discretion of cash-strapped councils. With local government facing a huge funding gap, it's difficult to see how it will be any different this time. It's also unclear whether this will reach the lowest paid workers in the care sector and other low paid jobs in the public sector that have been outsourced. It's also short-sighted. People working in the public services will spend in our local high streets. If you make someone feel economically insecure by freezing their pay, they may be less likely to spend, which in turn threatens more job losses in the private sector. The Labour group will be standing by our union colleagues in fighting this pay freeze. Mr Chairman, the original motion talked about inclusive growth. And it really is time we rethought things. We must harness the power of the market for economic good. We should support the role of the household as a maternal and, and paternal caring. And there's so much we need to do. We must look at our procurement with social value at its heart, with community well-being building, being embedded in all we do. We must step forward to support innovation we must remember for any innovation that makes a smartphone smart, microchips, touchscreens, the internet itself was initially funded by governments. So we can use our power for good in the economy, but we must start harnessing that and tackling inequality. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Councillor Young. Right, and I now will call on Councillor Reid. <laughs> Unless you want to defer it until later in the debate, Councillor Reid. I'll help you. Not on it now. Thank you, Mr Chairman. All the public, all the public sector workers, public workers, K 
care workers, teachers, teachers assistants and refuge collectors. Firefighters and all our dedicated public servants are the ones who are getting us through this crisis. Care workers have been caring for some of the most vulnerable and putting themselves at risk to do so. Firefighters have taken on vital additional tasks such as driving ambulances, delivering PPE and delivering food supplies to vulnerable people. Refuge workers have been keeping our streets clear and clean, often in conditions that don't allow for proper social distancing. Teachers and teachers' assistants have taught children and also have allowed parents to return to work, boosting the whole economy. The Chancellor's decision to freeze public sector pay next year means that all of these occupations will face a real term pay cut. This follows a decade of pay freezes and caps. Public sector pay was frozen from 2011 to 2013 and then it was capped at a 1% annual increase until 2018. There will not be a pause in how much rent, mortgages, food and transport costs that must be paid. Therefore, it will be the same workers whose wages still have not recovered from a decade of so-called pay restraint that will be affected. Pay restraint also means pension restraint because contributions will be less and will have a greater impact later in life. Hard choices can, cannot mean cuts and punishing those who have shouldered the burden of getting us through this crisis. Slashing public spending will not repair our economy or our communities. Balancing the books cannot be done on the backs of care workers, supermarket workers and those in local government and schools who have risked their lives for the rest of us. Investment in public works Sustainable jobs and skills is how we make the recovery, the shared recovery, with fairness at its heart. This is how we should be saying thank you to all these people for putting their lives at risk for the rest of us. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you. Right, we will now move to the debate and I'll give you an inkling of the running order. Councillor Robinson, you didn't need to put your hand up. Um, Councillor Wood. Councillor Young, Councillor Smith, Councillor Goggin, Councillor Henderson, Councillor Louis, and Councillor Moran. And uh, then we have, I believe, Councillor Moore has put his hand up. I'll, I'll stand along to the end of the list. And that is it. I now then ask Councillor Robinson to start the debate. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, can I say on behalf of the Liberal Democrat group that um, we broadly welcome this motion. Um, and I can say as a leader of one of the district councils, it has been good to, for, the, for the districts, the county and the unitaries uh, to, to work together during this crisis across party um, to do our level best uh, to get on top of the, the crisis. And as has been mentioned earlier today, all the staff in all of our public services have, have been phenomenal um, and that uh, needs to be put on record uh, right across the board, whether it's em emptying the bins, looking after open spaces, obviously care homes, um, uh, as well as, of course, the NHS. Um, so I welcome the cooperation that we've, we've seen. And this has been a really good example of local councils at their very best getting together and solving problems in their communities. And a particular example of this is the test and trace system where local councils have shown that they are better at it than central government with their big centralized uh, phone banks have not worked as nearly effectively as, uh, as at local government level. And it would have been a lot more effective if testing and tracing had been placed in the hands of local government who know their communities well. Um, the, uh, the, we have a little bit of a concern that paragraph three of the motion sort of broadens out uh, the, the, the topic and, and seeks to praise the county council on, in itself on a, on a range of other things. So I, um, I wouldn't want it to, to you know, go unremarked that there are 
you know, whilst this group welcomes uh, this cooperation on the coronavirus crisis, we, it doesn't mean we don't have concerns about things like libraries, youth service, waste management, and so on. Um, and that's not really the place here to, to debate those though. Um, there is a broader issue though, uh, about responding and dealing with coronavirus. And that's a, addressed in the Labour amendment, which is why the Liberal Democrats support that amendment. Um, we do need to uh, look at um, reducing the inequalities that were touched on in the previous earlier motion and, and how we enable in, inclusive economic growth um, that, is, that builds on the green agenda. So uh, the Liberal Democrat group um, supports the amendment, but we do support the, the broad thrust of the motion. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Robinson. Um, nice contortions on that. Right, Councillor Wood, again. Thank you, Chairman. I, I've, what, what Stephen said is exactly what probably I would say, so it's pointing me up. Thank, thank you, Councillor Wood. That, that gets us nearer to the lunch break, I have to say. Councillor Young, Julie Young. Uh, Mr Chairman, I have already spoken as, uh, to move the motion, so I can have another three minutes if no, you... No, no, I, I, I <laughs> mind you sure? Councillor Young. Absolutely, <laughs> don't, don't tempt me. Um, we'll go straight to <laughs> Councillor Smith, Kerry Smith. I think we'll we go, we'll try Councillor Alan Gogging. Councillor Smith appears not to be here. Oh, no, sorry, Mr. Chairman. I only want to speak on the previous motion. Oh, right. Oh, okay. I just You've got a Brucey bonus. Okay, it is a bonus, Councillor Gogging. Mr. Chairman, uh, I rise virtually, of course, to support the proposition from Councillor Spence regarding the COVID nineteen pandemic. This time last year, uh, the word pandemic practically didn't exist, or at least we weren't aware of the pandemic existence or the devastating effect it would play on our lives during 2020. COVID-19 has brought out the worst in some people, but it's also allowed the very best to emerge in others. Uh, it would be easy just to focus on what we haven't done, quicker or done better, all are easy with the benefit of hindsight. I am reminded of the opening paragraph of Charles Dickens' novel, The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. All of us have our own stories and experiences from our divisions. I can speak with certainty, passion and knowledge about the Brighton Division, but I'm sure what I'm about to say is similar to many of your own stories across the chamber. Uh, Mr Chairman, my division has 40 plus parish councillors. It has eight district councillors and one county councillor. They are from a broad church, similar to the county council. Without exception, all have worked hard in their communities. During the crisis, they've tried to make sure that nobody felt lonely or was overlooked or allowed to fall through the cracks in some of the systems. They achieved this by working together in their communities with the staff from Essex County Council, with the staff from the parish councils, with the staff from the district councils, together with local partnerships, organisations and friends. They brought together groups of people. They have been the real leaders in the communities. As I look at all of you and all of them, I'm very proud of what has been achieved and I'm certain we're all going to be even more proud of what will be achieved in the future. In Brightling Sea, the open gardens didn't happen, the firework display didn't happen, not the regatta, not the carnival, or the in bloom, not the free music festival, or the food and drink festival. Even the famous open air Lido didn't open, and we managed to flood our famous beach huts with a tidal surge. Mr. Chairman, but we did find time to become or become involved in delivering food parcels, collecting prescriptions helping with grants for small businesses, clubs and individuals, supporting food banks, walking dogs, and generally supporting our community. Uh, we have also continued to carry on with long existing charity work. As a good example, on Christmas Day in Brighton, for the 52nd consecutive Christmas year, Christmas Day, the Deputy's Christmas Gift Fund will provide a hot Christmas me meal 
and as importantly, company. I urge you to accept the proposition, and then as the real work begins, to act as community leaders and ensure that the work continues to be as successful and brilliant as it has been in the past. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Goggin, and it's obvious that your birthday has not uh, spilled your eloquence. I don't give any clue as to what age you may be. Um, Councillor Lewis indicated his name wasn't on this list, so we, we'll refine that for next meeting. I'll now go to Councillor Henderson. Thank you, Chairman. And um, I've been talking like others have um, when we did, when working with the voluntary sector. I was actually with my volunteer the Salvation Army the other day filling the Christmas boxes ready for some of those um, wonderful families which are going to need it over Christmas and worked quite closely with uh, Harwich Health so I'm on a um, Zoom meeting with them tomorrow night having another catch up to see where the gaps are and what other support we can provide with, within our, our community and I think one, one thing this um, pandemic has done it's actually shown more people who have volunteered the actual problems there are within the community. It's actually opened those gaps of where those people are and also shed a light on what's mm. um, some people, vulnerable people and older people who are living in uh, isolation and loneliness actually need. And because we're now delivering hot meals, uh, people have said they were really pleased with the service. And I remember when we were complaining and saying, please don't take away at Meals on Wheels because that's one way of keeping contact with older people in their homes and providing a service to make sure they got hot meals on occasion, especially uh, when we've seen over the last few months where their luncheon clubs they couldn't go to because uh, they weren't allowed to because of isolation uh, and um, social distancing, those clubs were closed down. So it's been a vital lifeline that those voluntary sectors have provided. And that, that's why our when you look at the, the motion, when it says about quality of life and health prevention, and that should be actually the number one priority for us all to make sure that we can um, pre uh, prevent any future illness. And that most of that is by living in isolation, not knowing how people are suffering in silence. And I think, what, what, like I said, one of the things that this has provided my groups, whether it be going out for shopping, shoppers shopping in, shops, people going around, like I said, topping up utility bills, uh, winter warmers going out, and central furniture. We're finding people haven't had a cooker, let alone actually um, cooking for themselves, um, being able to hot, have a hot meal. They've had to rely on microwaves. This is how bad things are out there. And I don't think some members still realize what the suffering is out there and what the poverty gap is within some communities. You may not be living in a community where this is going on, but I can assure you it's there in the face of many of those volunteers who have had to actually be that lifeline for those people over these few months. I just want to touch on our public sector workers. It's not actually a pay freeze, it's a pay cut. Because when you talk about the inflation going on top of that, it actually reduces their pay. And I think actually, Staff has done, whether it be at every district, um, borough, or county level, we should have been rewarding our staff, not taking money away from them. We wouldn't have survived. In the sun. We wouldn't have had that coordinated support for those voluntary sectors if we hadn't have had those loyal, genuine staff there behind us. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. I'm being generous on a little bit on the times, but with time presses on. Right, Councillor Moran. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I oppose the amendment and I support the motion. The reasons why I oppose the amendment is that I feel that this issue should have been brought on a separate motion. If we were to discuss public sector pay, that should have been done that way. I spent 34 years in the public sector and I wasn't motivated by the money, and the vast majority of people I worked with weren't motivated by the money. Most jobs in the public sector are vocational. It is part of your purpose in life, and it brings its own rewards as you flourish as a human being. 
The motion that the Conservatives have put forward seeks to um, note the fantastic service that people in the public sector, volunteers, and lots of other people did within the COVID uh, crisis, and they're continuing to do now. A large number of those people would have seen death on a scale that they hadn't seen before. I, in my time as a public servant, saw more death than I would wish upon anybody. And it is not gonna help in any way to deal with that by just putting some extra money into their wages. One of the problems that we have now is that the Chancellor has to balance the economy. If we were to give public sectors a, a significant pay rise, and I would love to do that, but I just don't think it's possible at this time, they would have the money, but what they probably wouldn't have was the nice little coffee shop that they used to go and sit and spend their money in. They would not have the independent shops, of which there are many in my division in South of Malden. And maybe the, cat, the, the Chancellor is correct because he is shifting towards keeping those small independent businesses going. And his support for them has been fantastic. I'd love to give the public sector workers lots, lots more money, but I don't think it's possible at this stage. I think one thing we can do and continue to do, and I certainly found it had more impact on me, is when you just say thank you. Thank you. I casually do it. If I see somebody who's a carer or a member of the uh, ambulance service or anybody in Tesco's, I walk up to them wearing my mask and I say thank you for what you do. That, I tell you, counts for more quite often than money in the back pocket. I support the Conservative motion and I oppose the Labour amendment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Moran. Right, um, I'll now call on Councillor Jeff Henry to uh, reply and wind up. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I um, <clears throat> very much support this motion as an opportunity to give thanks to residents and staff alike for the outstanding contribution during the last few months. As we've heard today in the leader's executive statement, we've seen thousands of volunteers step up forward and to provide support and assistance to some of those people who would be what we'd all consider to be the most vulnerable in our society, the most vulnerable people uh, within our communities and our local neighbourhoods. And it's been a pleasure to watch people you've never seen before in your, in your street knocking on a door with a bag of groceries for, for an elderly neighbour you haven't seen in a while. Um, <clears throat> if I'm honest, it's truly my wish that, you know, this community remains long after the com conversations about lockdowns and tears and, and COVID has ended. Um, the impact of COVID has brought disruption to every industry from aviation to TV soaps. We've seen many businesses forced to either adjust the model or stop it completely, either during lockdown or, or subsequently. My own business is no exception. For the duration of the, the lockdown, I had to transform my regular everyday um, high street opticians into an emergency NHS eye clinic to save the people of Essex from literally every single corner of it. Um, it's uh, quite a, a scary world being the only store open on the high street and, and wondering if any of the others will ever come back. But um, the, one, um, the one thing I'm proudest of is that um, I've been my business as a counsellor from work because obviously you can't come to County Hall, you can't go to your local, your local um, offices. And so the, the one thing that I'm truly grateful for is that at Essex County Council, it was business as usual. I may not be looking into offices or boardrooms. We may not be sitting together. We're sitting in, you know, some staff's back bedrooms or people's dining rooms and cats and dogs and kids running in and out. But it was business as usual. Our offices and service directors have never taken their eye off the day job. They've had to face into new ways of working, new challenges, longer days, but at all times they've maintained their passionate focus about the task of improving the health and well-being of all Essex residents. Um, to Councillor Robinson's point, it was lovely to see both districts and parishes and county working together to deliver for our residents. And it just proves that once you take the politics out of it and you concentrate on people, you can almost achieve anything you want. 
Mr. Chairman, I'm very proud to support this motion. I'm, I'm very, very, very happy to support it in its original form. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Right. Um, we will now put the Labour amendment to the vote. Councillor Spence, what is your vote? Against, Chairman. Thank you. And Councillor Aspinall? Councillor Aspinall, four. Thank you, Councillor Aspinall. And we'll just wait a few moments. And uh, my wonderful officers alongside me, well, not alongside me, the nine feet away each side, we'll, we'll come up with the result. Right, the result of that first vote was 4-16, against 49, abstain 4. The amendment failed. Therefore, we will now go on to the substantive motion, which is the original motion, and we will get your voting screens up. All right, Councillor Spence, your vote? Four. Councillor Aspinall? Uh, Councillor Aspinall, four, Chairman. Thank you, and it'll just take a moment or two. Right, the result of that vote is 65-4. Zero against, nil, and four abstentions. Therefore, the original motion succeeds. Now, it's just about half past one, and I think it is time to take a break. We've got the motions through. I'm hoping that we can pretty well gallop through later on this afternoon, certainly more swiftly than last time. Um, what's left, although of course we have in that um, oral questions. So I'm going to suggest that we have, say, a 20 minute break, as you are at home, of course, and you'd spend the rest of the time, I was going to allot you, waiting in a queue, were you? Yeah. So if we say that at 10 minutes to two, we will reconvene. I can't really read all these expressions. Yeah, there's some thumbs coming up. Right, oh, you've got 23 minutes. One question, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Kerry. You're not using those Dominion voting machines because the opposition might get Trump's lawyers involved. <laughs> yeah, well, I'm marching towards Georgia, Kerry, of course. No, I'm not. You know that this is the best of the best. It's Essex. Oh, it's worth the opposition having to try, isn't it? If Donald's having a go. That's just the puzzle to do, that's all, Kerry. Don't worry about it. Okay.
Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's That's my... I can't start without you, John, can it? Well, no, but I've got to keep to the exact timing, David, you know. Yep, well, I agree with you. I agree. <laughs> I mean, unless it's next to godliness, they say. Yes. Is that what it is? Okay. Not much godliness around here, Gavin. <laughs> I do. Just... I just watched Anglia News and I've seen John Spence again. And just Good. don't forget, we are on YouTube all. So no ribald comments about Councillor Goggins' birthday. We share a birthday, and it's mine today as well. Goodness me. Well, there's Who's some birth... good news in, isn't it? Whose birthday is it? Well, Alan, Alan and Goggin. Oh, Happy okay. Goggin. Happy birthday, Alan. I haven't seen any cakes yet. No, I was going to say that. Where's the cakes then? Is it, there is an answer to that, but I won't make it. Oh, don't think the cats so, are in the post. Yeah, yeah, I've heard that story before. <laughs> fun, fun, funnily enough, uh, Gavin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fun, funnily enough, Gavin, I just heard from Bern. I just heard from Bernard Jenkins that it's, it's, it's his wife's Anne's birthday today as well. No, there's something special about the 8th of December, Alan. That's it's just, it's, right, uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, oh, gentlemen. Vegetarians together, Gavin. Right. right, gentlemen, nice to have the badinage, but we are about to restart the meeting. I'm trying to stick with the um, 10 minutes too. Um, many of the, several of the next items are what I would sort of traditionally term to be noted, they're generally sort of boilerplate issues. I have got a couple of speakers on them. We'll move on to item number nine, annual report of the Audit, Governance and Standards Committee. And I'd like to receive that report from Councillor Headley. The recommendation will be on page 45, will be moved by Councillor and seconded by Councillor Headley. So, Councillor Headley. So, <clears throat> so, so, Chairman, I so move the recommendation which is in the papers at 2.1, and uh, that's it. Right, Mr. Hidley, you want a second and move the report? I'm very happy to second, uh, Mr Chairman. Oh, right, I thought it was going to be Councillor Hedley, but never mind. Well, on the order, yes, Chairman, you're right. It says on the order paper it's Councillor Hedley. Uh, it does, so I thought you said Councillor Bentley, that's why I jumped in. I didn't... No, 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 it's, uh, sure, it's just pure illusion of, uh, of uh, vowels and things. Councillor Headley, are you there? I possibly do. <clears throat> yes, I've been here all the time, Jeff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> can I just indulge a couple of minutes? Um, yes. As members will know, <clears throat> the former chairman of um, Audit and uh, Governance, <clears throat> her friend and colleague, Councillor Cutmore, was one of the first casualties of the, the crisis. Um, and he's sorely missed by all of us. We continue the work of the um, Audit and Risk Committee. And can I pay tribute to the dedication and the diligence of their officers in the finance team for all their hard work. It's not been easy over the past year and um, preparing very detailed financial papers and, ex and discussing and debating them in a virtual world. Um, I can commend the report to you and to the members and um, <clears throat> you will find the detail of what we've been working on in the Appendix 2, where there were 23 reports that went through the committee during the year. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Councillor Ledley. We do have uh, a question from Councillor Davis. Councillor Alan Davis. Can I not so much a question, um, Chair? It's more of a comment. Um, I just want to make a quick comment to say that we've um, had uh, an effectiveness review of the Audit Committee. Um, the report states we had an action plan for the way forward. An annual report such as this was to come to Council for the recommendations that SIP were put forward. Part of the plan was to have a briefing sessions where we were given more detail on specific subjects. Also, we've had an opportunity to have a pre-meeting to raise issues in preparation for the main audit committee. 
one of the most important items from the SIPFA recommendations was to interview and co-opt an independent member of the committee. And that independent me member has experience of all the committees and I find is a very welcome addition to the committee. I'd just like to say that all these additions are welcome improvements and uh, can only benefit the effectiveness of all it moving forward. Thank you, Chair. Um, right. I'm not sure we should we vote on this or is it is there anyone who uh, dissents? I'm, I'm saying it's agreed. It's just for council to receive the report. It's just to receive. Okay, that's it. Yeah, we do need a formal agree though, Councillor. Agreed. 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 Section one five one officer is satisfied with that. We'd move on to item number 10, and uh, this is flexible use of capital receipts strategy. And it's to receive a report, on, which is on page 56 of the agenda from Councillor Finch, and the recommendation will be moved by Councillor Finch. It will be seconded by Councillor Whitbread, not Bentley, Whitbread. Councillor Finch. Chairman, can I just interject for one moment, please, because there is um, a, an error under... Um, uh, point 1.5, where it notes, uh, nine, it says in the report 1920, in fact, it should say 2021. And I would move the re recommendations in the report with that change noted. Right, we have no speakers indicated. I did see Councillor Aspinall's on the screen. Um, Councillor Aspinall, do you, have you anything you wish to say? No, Chairman. Okay, th thanks then, Barry. I just I, when I see your, your your phone come up, I I do come to. Thank you, Richard. Muting. Yeah. Are you agreed then? Uh, is there any dissent? I can see. Do we have a cent on that? Yes. Agreed, Chairman. Agreed. 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 The access pension scheme, and uh, we'll to receive the report in the agenda from Councillor Barker. Um, recommendation to be moved by Councillor Barker and seconded by Councillor Platt and to be noted, I think. Well, thank you, Chairman. No, this does, have, this does have to be agreed, Chairman. This is a change to our inter authority agreement that we have with the eight and other access funds. Um, basically, there are two main changes. Paragraph 2.1, you have an explanation of how we need potentially to have more than one operator. Oh, 2.2, there is an enhanced role for all the Section 151 officers from all our planning, all our um, yes. So the recommendation set out 3.1 and 3.2 on page 61, Chairman. It does need to be voted on, please. Thank you very much, Councillor Barker. On that basis, I can ask for assent. Those who disagree, indicate. That is agreed. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Um, we'll now move on to item number 12. It's the Leader's Report of Cabinet issues again. Mr Chairman, Mr. Chairman yes, Councillor just, Johnson. Um, I normally wouldn't interject, but it says on here it's moved by Councillor Barker and seconded by Councillor Pat. I didn't hear the second. <laughs> You're absolutely correct, Councillor Johnson. And um, Councillor Platt. Could you indicate that you did um, uh, second that? You muted, I think. Yes, you did. I have indication on the screen. Thank you, Councillor Johnson. You're absolutely right to get it. You know, it's quite a big issue, this. All the place it may be, but nonetheless, it's quite important. And the the Lee's report on cabinet issues is um, a recommendation by Councillor Finch and seconded by Councillor Bentley to receive the minutes of the cabinet meetings, which all represented that, and to note those decisions that have been taken as urgent key decisions. I do have one speaker on this, which is Councillor Henson, but I will let Councillor Finch move. So move the recommendations, Councilor. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bentley. Happy to second. My apologies. The sound quality on my computer this morning is terrible, so I am missing every third word of everyone. But well, you. our signal has to wait through the strood, Kevin, so you know we will find that at times. <laughs> Right. Councillor Henderson, you had a question. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, it's on minute uh, 20th of October. 
and it's on page 73. And I did ask a question on this uh, cabinet where it said that uh, it's uh, item two approval of uh, appropriation of funds to reserves as follows. And it says about portfolio, lower demand in more or less the care sector. Um, could I ask uh, the portfolio holder, because there's recently been another question, um, a decision come out, which says that there's known pressures, there is high risk of provider failure. Could he give us an assurance if we are faced, because I'm now told that there's 1,700 vacancies within the, the care sector, uh, care home sector. Could he give us an assurance that if, if there is any um, any hint of any of those being in the situation where they could possibly be facing that failure, that the county council will step in to make sure that those residents and future residents are looked after and supported. Thank you, Councillor Anderson. Councillor Finch, I think. Yeah, thank you. I note the I note your comments, uh, Councillor Anderson. Indeed, the council will, as always, use whatever means necessary in order to protect the residents in, in any of our care homes. Is that satisfactory? Is this satisfactory right now? I do yeah. have to... Chairman, there was one other... I had one more uh, on this, on this uh, same item. On the um, minutes uh, 24th of November, it was put through Cabinet about the integrated waste handling contract service delivery. And I did mention at Cabinet that um, my concern was because there was part of that report that talked about rationalising the service. And in the minute, it doesn't reflect what was said. So I'd, I'd like to ask Portfolio again, if the County Council does take over our recycling centres, can he assure me and guarantee me that the Harridge and Dovecourt Recycling Centre will not be closed under these future proposals. Um, she still has to go to Councillor Finch because he's presenting the report, Councillor Henderson. Um, I certainly would um, understand the question that you've asked, Councillor uh, Henderson, and indeed I would uh, I would have to take counsel in the sense of talk with Councillor Walsh on this particular point because it's far bigger than just one site and it re relates to our overall waste strategy. So I will give you a written response to that question. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Henderson. And I do have two other uh, people asking for uh, access. Councillor Yang. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I am referring to the minutes of the Cabinet meeting held on the 24th of November and it's page 18, minute six. Um, and I think probably Councillor Harris will also want to ask about this. It, it was confirmed that early action would be taken in response to any quick wins identified in the commissioner's report, for example, those relied, relating to public rights of way. Um, and, and for me as a member, um, it's very uh, difficult to understand how we can actually get quick wins on public rights of way. So could you please walking, point out again uh, for I you, put Chairman? In mind, which is the key, we have a no, which is right on the front. And Julie, um, Julie can I stop Harris, you there? You, you, the station. you froze. You froze and we didn't hear or see anything. So Councillor Finch started to respond. Would you like to rephrase that last part of your question? So my question was, could yeah, uh, Councillor... It is getting confusing here. Could you finish, Julie? Yeah, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know where we can actually progress quick wins on the um, minute six. Did you get that on, on the meeting of the 24th of November about yeah. rights of way? I have two in Wiveno that desperately need some investment. I would have to go, I would have to understand how we're interpreting quick wins in regard to item six on the agenda, Chairman. And I'll yeah, have to give you. a written re response to that. Thank you, Councillor Finch. I would remind members not to expand on what happened. This is a question about the minutes. Right. Councillor Abbott is next. Um, thank you, Mr Chairman, and apologies to members if there's a problem on my sound. I'm being told at various meetings it can occasionally occur. 
Um, first of all, congratulations to the leader for such a wonderful backdrop. It's not often we have astronomy in council meetings. <laughs> I love it. Um, referring to the minutes of the November cabinet, uh, page 81, similar question actually to one that's already been raised. Um, the review of recycling centres. Um, in response to Councillor Pond, it was stated that the council's aim is to provide top of the range suite of recycling centres and also that maximising recycling will continue to be a significant factor. In that case, um, can it be reassured, please, that the Whittam Recycling Centre, which serves a significant population, will remain open and that also, as far as is practically possible, its services, which were reduced some years ago, and access arrangements will be fully restored. Thank you. And Chairman, if I may, the answer to that is in terms of the revision to the waste strategy and any undertaking that we take, any undertaking to review the waste sites, communicate and liaise with and talk with any of the councillors who might be affected by any decisions that we make. But at this point in time, there are no plans to make any major changes until we have clearly established what is the way strategy going forward. Thank you, Councillor Finch. We now have Councillor McCrory. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. My, um, this is a polite reminder to Councillor Gooding, page 77, uh, minute six, expansion of Colm Community School and College. He did undertake to uh, a written response and uh, I'm still waiting. I wonder if he could pick that up for me, please. Thank you. All right, Councillor Gooding, I'm sure the answer will be yes. Hmm. Uh, yes, uh, and apologies that I haven't responded uh, more quickly. Thank you, Councillor Gooding. <laughs> Councillor Harris is the last hand up. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Thank you very much. And thanks for uh, allowing me to just ask a couple of questions. One is on the waste. Um, when you do send the written questions to the various members, including Kent, Sir Henderson and Julie Young, could all members be copied in? Because obviously uh, the waste uh, recycling centres is, is an interest to all of our residents across whole of Essex. So it's pan-Essex, I'm thinking about to make sure we all are aware. The second well, point... I'll... The, Sorry. The, the second uh, point... Gonna... I, want... um, I, I think I'm wrong. You're rather overindulgent, Councillor Harris. You're asking two questions, but I will allow that and Councillor Finch will respond to them both. Thank you very much. Yeah, the second one really is over the public right of way. Uh, quick wins. I do thank Councillor Bentley, just as a side, for promising to walk through one of my prayers for me, and I'm very pleased he's doing that. He's been very helpful. But um, yes, if, if there are any quick wins on that, as Julie Young says, um, there are several that are going to help our residents. And I think uh, if I could ask, please, that all members are involved where the public rights away in their area, where there are quick wins, and take advice from the local residents and the local councillor. I think that's a wonderful thing to do, if you can do that. Thank you. Chairman, I think I've noted uh, Councillor Harris's two questions, and indeed the first part in terms of a, a, a reply, there clearly would be a re an electronic reply on the questions. Uh, to all members about um, rights of way and quick wins. And I note the points that um, Harris has made in the second part of his question and indeed will respond accordingly to that point. Thank you, Councillor Finch. And right, that... Mr Chairman, just a point of order, if I may, uh, just to say I'm delighted I'll be joining Councillor Harris socially distanced, I just want to the record, and secondly, with the hundreds of uh, uh, footways we have and public rights of way, uh, as much as it would be nice, I will not be walking through all of them. I'm just saying that to everyone, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bentley, for that. I noticed the new slimline version, so I'm impressed at how uh, many ways you must have been down. Um, right, I, I'm a little bit concerned that you are using Cabinet issues to raise general questions, because, of course, we have all questions. Just a, just a point. Please try not to overindulge. Right, we will now move on to clarification of answers provided in response to written questions and I'll remind you as I always do that any questions of clarification are permitted but I will reject a question if I don't believe it's clarification if I think it's a wander down the realms of some specific ideology it will not be allowed it has to be pertinent to the question and answer and actually I have to say you've been very good so, far. so we will commence Councillor Mitchell are you happy with your response
Councillor Mitchell. Never mind. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, the normal operation of the uh, the mute doesn't play the game. Thank you. Okay, um, Councillor Young, question two. Are you happy with your answer? It's a massive reply. Uh, it is a good re response, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess my question would be, in the in the dialogue of the answer, it says that um, uh, one in in four people that uh, take their own lives are actually known to mental health services. Um, and then it says uh, later on in the um, answer about uh, people not meeting the threshold for statutory services. So I think uh, the question I would like in terms of a clarification is whether there's going to be a new mm -hmm. approach or, uh, or not to actually bringing people into services because it does concern <coughs> me, especially in Colchester and Tendring. Uh, such a high levels of, of suicide. We've had two in Colchester that are under the age of 18. So are we going to change the approach in terms of um, being qualification for services? That's a suspense, I think, and that is going to be a very complex reply. It may well be a, yet another written reply. Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, Councillor Young. And yes, indeed, we all share an acute concern about the levels of suicide in Essex. Secondly, it's very clear there's very diverse factors, Chairman, to what's causing uh, this. And one of the factors, for instance, are people who have had high-pressure jobs in London. Um, uh, we know that. That, that is a, a particular cadre of uh, middle-aged uh, people uh, who have not been in the system but may have got to the wit's end. I'm very happy, Councillor Young, to take away the question of reviewing the thresholds into the system. <coughs> And listen to my motion earlier, what I've equally expressed is what we need to do is get far better at identifying anxiety and depression before they become oh. mental illness. Thank you, oh, okay. Right. We'll now move on to question number three. I hope you're satisfied with the response you've got, Councillor Harris. Councillor Harris. Yes, thank, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Thank you. And uh, I do look forward to working with Councillor Bentley, uh, as we all should do, on that review. Thank you. Fine of you. Um, right, we'll now go to Councillor Young. Uh, another question, another comprehensive reply. Councillor Young, are you satisfied with that? Um, yes, satisfied with it. I guess I suppose I would be seeking um, the Cabinet member to look at how we can address the needs of the extremely vulnerable in terms of food supplies. Yes, we made decisions in the past about our meals and wheel service, but I think we've all learned through uh, this last pandemic that you know the, the, just the taking of vitamin D has protected people. And maybe that's something we should consider going forwards in terms of nutrition for the elderly. Thank you, Councillor Young. I, I'm sure that's been picked up. Councillor Reid, question five. Are you happy with the answer? Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. And Councillor number six, Councillor Reid. Uh, yes, thank you. Oh, well done, Councillor Reid. It's, it's a very <laughs> comprehensive reply, actually. Um, question number seven, Councillor Davis, uh, do you have any points of clarification you require? Yes, clarification, please. Which part of the answer would you like clarified? Um, the response um, seems to be technical response, but the intent behind the question was that on um, LHP speed surveys come back often within average tolerances or within you know the uh, allowances within the speed zone. And that's normally a result of, um, um, although they were within the, uh, the within the speed limit, you do see points where cars are massively zooming around, massively over the speed limit, and they're brought down by cars that, cars that appeared in the law at 20. So it kind of averages out at, within the speed limits. So that what I would like to see is a, um, a methodology, a policy, whereby speed limits are based on safety rather than within um, the tolerances of the speed limit. So could you respond to that, please? So it's a big ask and it is a question rather than a clarification. I'm sure that Councillor Bentley 
will have a, an answer, a, a more extended answer to you. Councillor yeah, Benley. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, well, the answer is, of course, it's down to what technology allows, what the law permits as well. I understand the question, if a car is doing 70, another car does 20, then the average is going to be around 40. So I do understand the question behind that. But technology doesn't allow us to do anything different to that. It doesn't capture individual speeds of individual cars. And what would you say as well, as much as I am going to review this, as I've said previously, and it is something I'm very passionate about to make sure people behave within the speed limits, it is down to driver behaviour and speed, of course, is a police matter. So please refer any known speeders to or speeding vehicles to your local police and they can monitor that area and they're the ones that can enforce it. We will do our very best look at speed limits with the technology we have, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Bentley. Now, Councillor Scordis, reply, I thought. Do you have any clarifications? No, all good. Thank you, Councillor Scordis. Councillor Durham. Thank you, uh, Chairman. Just a brief uh, clarification point, if I may. Can I congratulate the Cabinet member and the library team for getting the libraries open? Um, I'm sure that's welcomed by the residents. Could the Cabinet member advise whether all of the Essex County Council libraries are now open, please? Councillor Barker. Um, yes, they are all open. Um, we are looking at a slightly revised winter schedule with some of the libraries actually staying open till seven o'clock one evening a week, but all 74 libraries are open, so please come and visit. Excellent. Thank you very much, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Barker. Um, I was in the Cultural Library at the weekend. I was the only person in there. Uh, right. Uh, question number 10. Councillor Harris, are you happy with that? Yes, uh, thank you, sure with thing, and thank Councillor Gooding for their answer. Thank you very much. That's kind of you, Councillor Harris. Councillor Scordis, question 11, are you happy with that as well? All happy. Thanks, Councillor Scordis. Uh, Councillor McCrory, question 12. No clarification, Chairman, thank you. And not thank you. on the following one either. Thank you. Oh, well, jolly good. I can jump now to question 14. Councillor Baker. Councillor Baker. Yeah, thank you, Mr Chairman. Yeah, yeah. I was disappointed, but I'd like to thank uh, Councillor McGinley for the reply. I, I shall write to uh, the House of Commons myself with regard to the local children's hospices. Okay. Thank, thank you, you Councillor Baker. Right, Councillor Deakin, I believe, has left, so there won't be any supplementary. She has other business uh, as, as Mayor of Chelmsford. So we'll move on to Councillor 16 as Councillor Deakin as well. And then we have Councillor so we have 17, which is Councillor Abbott. And do you have any clarification required, Councillor Abbott? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, th thank you for the, to the Cabinet member for his um, response, which was fairly helpful. I didn't really detect in there a recognition of the unprecedented nature of the disruption and damage caused to our rural village of Riven Hall and, near, and other nearby villages by very large HGVs off routing. In terms of my last line of my question, how in the future can we prevent this happening again? Well, very short question, and I suspect a very complex answer. Councillor, well, well uh, I mean, of course, as I'll reiterate, the eight of us, Highways England, they're doing the work, they're rerouting onto our roads. Uh, when you divert uh, vehicles, they can only go in so many directions, and wherever you divert them is going to upset someone. The key to this, of course, I'm sure Councillor Abbott would agree, is to reduce the number of cars on the road and therefore reduce the number of vehicles that have to be diverted. So I'm sure he'll join me in what we are doing as an administration to make sure the reduction takes place. In the meantime, we will monitor work as closely with Highways England as we can to mitigate as many uh, vehicles coming off uh, the A12 when it's being repaired. And of course, it's going to go through a process of major redevelopment in the coming months and the next year or so. Uh, so we need to be very careful of that. But bearing in mind also that we are, uh, many of these vehicles are coming from the seaports of, of Felixstone Harwich as well, and that's part of the economy. So it is a complex question. It's not just a simple case of stop them coming through the village. We have to work much better, but reduce where we can to get more freight on to rail. Isn't it? Thank you, Councillor Bentley. And the last question, the written question, is by Councillor Henderson of uh, Councillor of Children and Families. Councillor Henderson, it's a comprehensive reply. Have you any clarification you need? Yeah, just one clarification, uh, Chairman. Um, the portfolio said that she stands by what she said in 2015. Does she mean by that that she supported every cut in um, benefit that the government's introduced since then? Um, that's a trick question, perhaps, but nonetheless, I'm sure that Councillor McKinley could do it. No, it's not. That's unfair. 
It's a reasonable question, but Mickey Councillor McKinley. Thank you, Chairman. I mean, clearly, I haven't got a list of every single cut that's been made, as, as Councillor um, Henderson puts it. I think what we're doing for families and for vulnerable children, I, I'm very clearly, um, through earlier discussions today, through social media postings, through the information that I've sent directly to what's going on in their area. And I've, I've clearly highlighted the commitment of the administration to continue to do all that we can do. So I stand by that and will obviously keep members updated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor McKinley. That's the end of clarification of answers. Not too many sort of rambles uh, off into other side issues. So on that basis, we'll move on to item number 14. No, no, number 14, we're nothing on. I'm getting mixed up here. Um, oral questions to the leader, it's cabinet it's members, it's chairman of committee, council for on the police fire and crime panels. Now I have I have oral questions put down here. Um, I can see Councillor Aspinell, and I think I'll take you first, Barry, if you are wishing to ask a question. You're not on the list, but uh, I'm happy to take you. Thank you, uh, Chairman. I should have been on the list, but. Nevertheless, uh, my first question is to the leader of the council, and it concerns Miss Sold PPE. Um, Felix Stowe Docks apparently is full of um, unusable PPE or PPE that doesn't fit the standards that we uh, yes, adhere to. Have we got any of that from our purchases? Um, and are our purchases and the results of them coming to some sort of audit? Thank you. Right. I'm not sure to whom that should be addressed. Well, he's suggested, leader. Chairman. It's leader, yeah. It, it's been addressed to me. So, so the answer to the question, first of all, is in terms of uh, the... I'm not aware that we have currently or indeed in the immediate past any equipment which is not suitable for use. I can, as a generalization, say that there were um, considerable stories at the very early stages of acquisition of PPE, that there were products that were sourced that were not fit for use, but I'm not aware in detail of any particular cases where we purchased PPE that was not suitable for use, uh, general use. However, I will ask um, I will ask the more detailed question that's been posed of our officers to make sure that the answer I've given you is at least appropriate. And indeed, if there is any inaccuracy in terms of we have been um, unfortunate to purchase PPE that isn't suitable, I will let you know in a written reply. Thank, thank you very much, Chairman. My second and last question is to Councillor Bentley. And it's in response to pressure that's being put on me as the county member for my division um, regarding discarded road work signs after works have been completed that have not been cleared up. And also fixed signs which announce to drivers that road layouts there are new road layouts and to take notice of the warning that have been in place in my division for some six years, uh, attached to lampposts in particular areas that have been mentioned more than a dozen times, I'm reliably informed, to uh, the Highways Department and indeed to our Chief Executive. And the last time I got a correspondence from this person, they were threatening to take legal action against me. I'm not sure that they can, but to do something about it. It's not one of my residents. They live in Chigwell. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Osman. Uh, Councillor Bentley. So not all roadway signs are Essex highways. There can be utilities in some cases. Uh, and uh, the best thing to do is to let me know. Email me. I can't speak to you. But he would have given you the answer uh, uh, as, as uh, his officers would have reported to him. Uh, but if you have cases, what I'd like, if possible, is a photograph and their location. If it shouldn't be there, we'll get it removed. Thank you, Councillor Bentley. Thank you very okay. much. Right, now I'm, I'm going to go down the list because I'm going to close it. Um, we have Councillor Young, Councillor Pond, who's asked for two. 
Councillor Abbott, and he's indicated who, whom he wants to ask. Councillor Robinson, Councillor Smith, Councillor Reid, she's a indicated she wants to ask Councillor Spence. Um, Councillor Wood, I'm not really that happy with asking you asking three questions, but there, that's what you were allowed to do. Uh, Sorry, Chairman, I've, I've, I've realised I was wrong, so I've only got two questions. Sorry, Chairman. <laughs> Well, that's that's a thirty-three percent benefit to me, anyway. Councillor Henry, you will be speak, asking Councillor Spence. Councillor Egan, you'll be asking Councillor Spence, and I have Councillor Davis. That is it on the list. So we'll move to Councillor Young. Your question. Uh, sorry, thank you Chairman. very much. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Uh, um, I, did ask the, I did ask to be on the list this morning. Well, you ain't on the list, but nonetheless, Councillor Garnet, I, I will take you, even though you cut across my diatribe. I do apologise. Uh, Chairman, Chairman, it's Councillor Kendall. Yes. Um, I should be on your list, Chairman. I did ask to go on your list. And I have sent two questions to the Cabinet members beforehand to give them prior notice. Oh, OK, then, Councillor Kendall. It certainly isn't, but nonetheless, I totally believe you, and I might have got an out-of-date list in front of me. You never know. So I'll put you on. I, can't um, I wouldn't be too happy about a multitude of questions, though. Right, Councillor Young, I think we've Chairman. got... Councillor Butland. I'm sorry, I, I did pass to Joanne Bowler my name. I, I'm sure it might make the nine foot between you and her with a, with a bit of luck. Right, I, I did, and she now confirms the fact that she did get that. Well, the list is getting longer, is it not? Thank you, Chairman. Right. OK, well, in that case, I hope you are um, um, going to become overcome by the exuberance of your verbosity, any of you. Right. Councillor Young. Not that that would apply to you, Councillor Young. No, mine will be not too, not too long, but we'll see. Um, it's, Council, it's to Councillor Bentley. And um, at the start of the meeting, in answer to a question to a member of the public, and I wrote it down. He said, in terms of highway repairs, priorities based on the roads that have the most interactions. Sounds reasonable, doesn't it? So over the last few weeks, I've been monitoring the Jolly um, Pop um, uh, programme that as members we were able to nominate potholes to. Um, and um, I've been hoping to see some good news, but um, I haven't had any good news. So over the last few weeks, I started looking, and the first week, I think, there were four in Shrub End. Question. The, the question is coming, but the detail is important. The next week, there was two in Shrub End. The next week, there was two in Shrub End. So I don't know what Councillor Harris has done, but he's obviously done the right thing to the portfolio holder. However, um, when he says about priority to the, those that have the biggest interactions, one of those in Shrubbin was Cannons Close, Mr Chairman. Now, Cannons Close serves 10 houses. Now, I have 39 potholes in the main drag down the avenue from the top to the bottom, 39. And I seem to be waiting still for any good news. So I asked the cabinet member, can I look forward to getting any good news before Christmas? Councillor Bentley, there was a rather roundabout question, but no. No, I've, I've got it, I've got it. I, I think the difference is, of course, Councillor Harris asked me to go on nice walks with him. That's that's what it pinches it for me. Um, the serious point of this is, uh, of course, it's it's about uh, the interaction at those sites. But all these potholes in the top 50 will be done by March. I told you that, and that's what will happen. They can't all be done at once, and these are in addition to other works we are doing. So if this is one of your top 50 ones, I don't know you didn't indicate or not, but if it's on, a, if you reported it, either through that system or the usual system, it will be done. But it's about priority, and safety is also a priority as well. So I didn't see the one at the cannons you mentioned, but if that was quite deep and quite dangerous, that would be done before yours. But yours will be done, don't worry, it's before Christmas. I don't run that list. That's run by professional officers. But just keep watching those weekly lists and you will get lucky, certainly before the end of March. Thank you, Councillor Bentley. Now, Councillor Pond has been very asking for indulgence on having two questions. So, Councillor Pond, I know you can be succinct. Very kind of you, uh, Chairman. Uh, first one uh, is for the leader. Uh, are you aware, Chairman, that uh, 
three generations of my family were post office employees. And I, I am second to none in appreciating the work done by postmen and postwomen in all weathers. However, I am getting a lot of complaints about deliveries of mail. Uh, I know they have problems. Uh, would the leader be prepared to speak to the uh, director of the Eastern Region of uh, Royal Mail to seek clarification of uh, these delays and to try to expedite uh, improvements? Right, Councillor Pinch, that's his first question. Uh, Chairman, um, I, I have a question for Councillor Pond, and the first question to Councillor Pond, have you tried actually talking to the Chief Executive of the Eastern Region of the Post Office to elucidate his support in the delivery of your mail in a much... No, Chairman, I haven't, manner. because uh, I am too junior and too insignificant, whereas the leader <laughs> of the Council has a good deal of welly behind him, as well as the Eastern Northern Essex Lights in his background. Um, Chairman, I'm, I'm grateful for the response to my, my first question. And the answer to the second part, or rather the first part of his question is, I am happy to engage with the um, Chief Executive of the Eastern Region of the Post Office to see if I can make any improvement to the delivery of mail, not particularly to um, Councillor Pond, although I, clearly I will make that a focus, but also an improvement of the service. I do have to say that I have absolutely no problems in my very tiny village with the delivery of the post, which turns up every day without fail and with great politeness and with great um, reference to any gates that are open or need to be closed as well. So I can applaud them for what they do. Clearly, I will have words with the Chief Executive to see what I can elucidate in your behalf as well, Councillor. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, uh, my, second you have a second. Question, my second question is rather different. Uh, is the Cabinet member responsible for libraries aware that, contrary to the assurance she gave me in the summer, half of the floor space of Lalton Library has been cleared of um, books and other resources? However, in doing so, is she further aware that she has inadvertently provided some 3,000 square feet of DDA compliance space next to a very large car park? Will she make this county council space into the main testing uh, and vaccination space for Epping Forest or consider doing so? Councillor Barker, there you can say yes or no, or you can whatever. I, th I think, Chairman, if I could, I'll have a conversation with Councillor Pond offline on this. Very sensible. <laughs> Thank you for that, Councillor Barker. Um, I, next on my list, I have Councillor Abbott for a question. Councillor Bentley. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, it's that time of year again when I need to ask Councillor Bentley about flashing bollards, uh, which continue to flash uh, in Whitham and other places. Um, as a suggestion, would it be an idea for the County Council to have a programme to replace them with reflectors, which would remove the annoyance, eliminate the electricity bill for the County Council and be good for climate change? Councillor Bentley. Councillor Bentley. Kevin, you're on the... Oh, sorry. No, no, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Um, I realise we've just gotten on. So I'll just start. I'll just rehearsing the question. I'll, I'll get the question out for real now. Um, so, uh, yes, thank you, Councillor Abbott. You asked me this last year, as you said, and I then had a deluge in my inbox of people saying, and what about my flashing bollard? Please don't do that. Please report that through the proper systems. We are going through a programme of changing it. So we're having less and less of these lit up bollards and more of the static ones that you will see, the reflector ones you've talked about. Uh, as I keep saying, highways... Uh, is a very complex uh, department and it has many calls on the public purse uh, and everything can't be done at once. But this is something we are starting to do. And uh, of course, you're absolutely right. If they're not relying on electricity, then of course it is good for the uh, climate. So that's why we are uh, having that programme and we will be getting to a bollard near you as soon as possible. Councillor Bentley, right. We'll now move on to Councillor Robinson. Thank you, Chairman. Always leaping back 
Yeah, get to the bus. Yeah, sorry, thank you. Um, I had already notified, I think, Councillor Bentley that I, I want, could I ask Councillor Bentley, um, what are the plans to com uh, complete uh, the items on the Chelmsford City Growth Package? Um, because I believe um, that, we, that more money has been spent than was, it, than was expected, particularly on the uh, Great Waltham to Centre Chelmsford cycle route. Uh, so, I, I wasn't notified you were going to ask me the question, it doesn't matter, you're perfectly entitled to ask me. Uh, yes, we, we do have to uh, look at the growth package. It will be done because you're probably done. Uh, the exact overspends I don't have in my head, so I'm going to look at that and I will give you a proper written reply that all your chumps of colleagues can see. Thanks very much. That would be appreciated. I'm sure we can work together on this, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> Honour me. Wonderful. Councillor Kerry Smith. Thank you, Mr Chairman. First question, there's only two very brief questions. First one is to Councillor Bentley. The scheme in Cherry Down East that both I and Councillor Bentley have spent much time discussing previously. The roadworks are all open, but it's very confusing because the new sites have not been erected. And I'm concerned that there's going to be someone going the right way round as it was instead of the correct way round as it should be. Is it possible, Mr Chairman, the Cabinet Member for Highways can have the contractor attend and put the signage up so people know the correct way to go around Cherry Down East Station Way and Clay Hill Road, please. Henley. Uh, I wasn't aware of the issue. I should look into it straight away. But while I'm on, perhaps I can indulge you and crave uh, your indulgence, sir, and crave your indulgence, uh, Mr Chairman, because I think Councillor Smith said he went to look at our new e-scooters. Now, what they look like, are they good? Well, I was just sizing them up, Mr Chairman, to see how they fit in the back of my car. I've heard there's a boat sail on a weekend. You heard it here yeah. first, everyone. Thank you very much. They have mighty suspension on them on that basis, then, Councillor Smith. Both of you are going to drive them. Never mind. We'll go on to your second question. My second question is on a more serious note to the leader. There are concerns that this county could be split. Uh, one part in Tier 2, another part in Tier 3. If that were the case, what is his thoughts on that subject? A rhetorical question, but nonetheless, I'll ask the leader if he wishes to reply. Councillor Pinch. He's on mute. On mute, David. I was doing the same as Councillor Bentley. I was practicing my answer before I gave the answer, so I do apologise, Chairman, for that mistake. Um, clearly, at this point in time, the position that I would have is that I would be lobbying for a whole less the actual problem, and I await, obviously, information from Public Health England as and when there are there is a view on what should be done in Essex. And the moment I know what the recommendations are for Essex, I would be communicating, as I have done consistently with all the leaders of the district, boroughs and city uh, in Essex about any position that, there may be, that may be proposed. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Right, we'll go move to Councillor Pat Reid. Question to Councillor John Spence. Councillor Reid. Thank you, uh, Mr Chairman. I actually think my the question I was going to put to Councillor Spence is um, actually happening. It was about the um, any plans in place to initiate an operator scheme where people can have a lateral flow test. Um, especially those who are possibly asymptomatic. Um, it's proved to be extremely successful in Liverpool, um, where those who had no symptoms were spreading uh, the virus um, and having no knowledge of being contagious. But obviously, um, in my own area in Basildon, we now have um, a council uh, a place in the in, in Basildon with the lateral flow testing going ahead so um, I presume this is happening all over Essex the, these plans are being initiated thank you Councillor Reid I'll, I'll pass that to Councillor Spence Councillor Spence thank, thank you Chairman thank you Councillor Reid I can indeed confirm that lateral flow testing is now in operation in Essex we are giving priority to Basildon because that is where the rates of infection are highest and we have now deployed uh, capacity there in excess of 10,000 tests a week. 
we will continue to uh, focus the lateral flow testing on areas of greatest need, including those uh, who wish to be involved with visiting care homes. Councillor Spence. Councillor Wood, you have two questions. You haven't said to whom, but you have two, so crack on. Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. My first question is to Councillor Goodin. Please inform me of what action he's going to take with academy schools or any schools that are actually uh, making people, making their staff redundant, please, on that one. And my second one, I think is to Councillor Spence, and I'd like to know um, why it seemed to have taken two years of me, me pandering to you or pandering to you about suicide and us, Essex being the worst in, in the country, why it's taken me doing that two years for us to actually now get a grip of the problem. Thank you. Good answer on that. Right, we'll, we'll go first of all to Councillor Gooding. <coughs> Well, thank you, and thank you to um, Councillor Wood for the, for the question. Um, I think he has written to me in the past about this, and I have uh, responded. Uh, it is unfortunate but that we don't have any control over the management and operation of academy schools. That is a matter for the uh, academy trust or the multi-academy trust. And I would suggest that um, whilst we keep a close watch on, on, on um, uh, what they're doing and the adequacy of the provision that they're giving for children, um, we don't have that power of intervention. I would suggest if he has further concerns um, that he writes directly to uh, the Academy Trust and uh, request a response from them. Um, th that is all I can say because I, we do have limited um, authority in that respect. Thank you, Councillor Gooding. That's very good. Um, right, and the second question I suspect was to Councillor Spence. Thank you, Chairman and uh, Councillor Wood. I do understand your frustrations on this issue. I think suicide is, a, is an appalling thing. It is the ultimate outcome of mental illness, and we must always focus first on preventing the conditions which cause the suicide. But I must refute your suggestion that nothing's been done for two years. Far from it, we've been working hard to continue to try to understand in much more real-time ways the underlying causes of suicide. Councillor Young referred earlier to the lengthy answer I gave her. Uh, and, and it really is a, a, a very complex topic because there are very many different reasons at play. I think I would confirm, Chairman, because there have been many apocryphal stories across Essex. There is no evidence of a significant spike in suicide during the COVID crisis. We have taken on people now. We have taken on capacity council wood within the county council some months ago. That culminated in a full session at the highway at the Health and Wellbeing Board in November. There is much still to do, however, and I can assure you that we will continue to work as we have done on this very difficult problem. Thank you, Councillor Spence. And just to refresh those who are waiting, the list is as follows. Councillor Henry, Councillor Egan, Councillor Davies, Councillor Garner, Councillor Kendall and Councillor Butland. Right, we'll now move on. Councillor Henry, you have a question for Councillor Spence. Thank you, Chairman. Um, given the comments from Basildon Council on social media, what are Essex County Council, or what steps are Essex County Council taking in response? Uh, thank you, Councillor Henry. Councillor Spence. Thank you, Chairman, and thank you, Councillor Henry. The level of infection in Basildon is very severe. It is therefore incumbent in part on all politicians from whatever council to work in partnership together. It is critical that we spend all our time on that. So I regret comments that are made on social media that seek to undermine that alliance. I'm very clear that Essex County Council couldn't do more than it's doing. We have created a task force bringing together all the disciplines. The education function was involved with the leader and me in meeting state court this morning and we are actively working with the head teachers of the schools to understand what they think is best for their pupils so that they can make the decisions which are right for their schools. We have significantly increased the testing piece as I responded to Councillor Reid earlier. We are working very hard both with uh, schools and with um, large workplaces in Basildon. We have a major communications campaign involving celebrities so that we aim at all the relevant populations given the unusual demographic in, in uh, uh, Basildon, where over 40% of all cases can be linked to schools. So, Chairman, whatever the social media may say, 
I can say to members of this council that we are doing a very full and comprehensive job in support of our colleagues and the residents of Hazelton. Thank you very much, Councillor Spence. Councillor Beverly Egan. Thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd like to ask a question of Councillor Spence, if I may, please. Um, so in view of the statements regarding the current COVID situation in Essex, reflect on the work of um, your portfolio to date, please, Councillor Spence. Uh, Councillor Spence, did you get that? It was yes, I did. Thank you, Chairman. It was, a, it was an excellent question, Councillor Egan. Thank you, because I think it's quite right we should look at ourselves. So, in October, we recommended to the Secretary of State, along with the leaders of all the councils of Essex, that we move into Tier Two. I am entirely satisfied that that saw that enable us to suppress the rising curve of illness. We reduce the rate of infections, reduce the hospital pressures. Uh, and we thus save lives as well as jobs because ultimately avoiding tier three is our goal. We have continuously asked ourselves the question since are we doing enough? We've been on the leading edge of track and trace where we have an 86% efficacy rate, one of the highest in the country. We've been identified by the cabinet office as the place they should come to visit and they have issued a very satisfactory report on what we're doing. Only yesterday at meetings regarding the latest increase in infection across the county, Chairman, Public Health England commented that we could do no more than we are doing. So, Chairman, I'm not complacent. If anybody tells me things we should be doing that we are not doing, they will be considered. But overall, Councillor Regan, I believe we can say honestly to the residents of Essex, we are doing as good a job as any council could be in this country. Thank you very much, Councillor Spence. Very good. Um, Councillor Davies, and you can take your hand down, Councillor Davies. It's slightly distracting, but uh, go ahead with the question. Here we go. Um, thank you. I think this one's to the leader. Um, what contribution, uh, financially or other, uh, otherwise, would the administration make in investing in young people? Uh, towards the creation of the Basildon Youth Zone, which is already underway. That's a pinch. It must be mute. mute somewhere. Councillor Finch. Could you unmute from uh, the midst of your Aurora Borealis? Yeah, I'm trying to find the... You're there. Am I there? You're there. Okay. Uh, Chairman, um, you've had a... There's already been within the motions and the conversations and the speeches that have been made from the, this side of the House that, in fact, it's very clear that we have been doing excellent work in our youth services across the, across the county for a number of years now, and indeed that it is... Um, an award-winning service that we are providing. I do not see that there is a need for us to specifically invest in the youth zone, which may be a pet um, subject for the Labour group, but it's not necessarily one that I would necessarily invest in at this point in time. I have therefore no plans at this point in time because I have not received any recommendations or reports that suggest that we should invest in it. There are no plans at this point in time to invest in the use zone in any part of Essex, not just around Basildon. Thank you, Councillor Finch. Right, we'll now go to Councillor Garnet. Thank you, Chairman, and I apologise for if there's been any misunderstanding about my wishing to ask. Right. Uh, is to Councillor Barker, Portfolio Holder for Libraries. Can the Portfolio Holder thank the Cabinet for the successful bid to seal it for almost £1 million and Essex County Council is investing nearly £200,000 for the refurbishment of the Harlow Town Library. Councillor Barker. Thank you, Councillor Garnett. Yes, um, this is one of a number of really exciting projects. Um, we are hoping to co-locate the adult community learning offer within the Harlow Library to refurbish the whole of the library. Um, Harlow Council are offering to put their hand in their pocket as well, so it's a real multi-agency working. Um, just to let members know, we have other exciting uh, projects underway in Shenfield, where I'm holding a further Zoom meeting this evening to hear from the public about refurbishment there and the provision of some flats. 
And I'm hoping that both on Harlow and on Loughton Libraries, we will have some public meetings in the new year so the public can tell us uh, what they think about our plans. But thank you for your question. It was only a very little bit of the sell-out money we got. There were multi-million pounds. So the officers did a brilliant job very quickly of getting those bids in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barker. Right, Councillor Kendall. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, first question is to... Um, first? Uh, sorry, first, uh, two questions, Chairman, very quick ones. First one is to um, Cabinet Member uh, Simon Walsh. Um, please could the Cabinet Member give me an update on what action the County Council is going to take to address the serious parking problems in the lanes and roads around Thorndon and South World Country Parks that are caused by visitors to the parks not being able to find a space to park. So th thank you, uh, Chairman. Uh, Councillor Kendall and I have exchanged emails some while back, so I'm a bit surprised this has come in as an urgent question. I think you would have had time to put in a written on this one. However, I'm pleased to provide some uh, uh, context to this. Uh, clearly, as I alluded to earlier when talking about green flags, we have seen a really significant increase in the use of the country parks, three and a half times more than uh, an equivalent period last year and the previous two years on average. So that's quite extraordinary. Um, and at this time of year, of course, we can't use our grass overflow car parks um, because of the damage that does to the grass. So what we have done uh, by way of an update is that we've uh, implemented car parking stewards at Thorndon North and Weald for the past two weekends. And we're looking to extend those through to March, 2021. Um, we are in discussions with the South Essex Parking Partnership to see if more can be done about the parking outside the country parks. Clearly, um, it is the attitude of drivers who park on those highways causing obstructions that needs to be addressed. And there's only so much country park staff can do to uh, obviate that antisocial behaviour, because that's exactly what it is. Um, whether we are able to implement red lines or indeed clear ways has yet to be seen, uh, but that might be a solution. Um, we're using social media messaging uh, and also uh, to really explain when it's busy and inviting people to dip into the websites to check when the busy times are happening. And finally, Chairman, I have uh, for the past few weeks been discussing this problem with officers from country parks to see whether there's more we can do within the parks themselves to increase car parking. Clearly, business cases will need to be worked up and funding to be found. Um, and of course, some spaces are limited in terms of how far you can expand these car parks. And of course, you have a conflict between having a car park and the open space people are going to enjoy. And I suppose if I can add one further point, we would encourage... We would encourage the public to look at more sustainable ways of visiting country parks, which don't involve the motor vehicle. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walsh. If Councillor Goggin could press his mute button. Thank you. All here is telephone call. Councillor Kendall. Press uh, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you for that so comprehensive answer. Um, I was waiting for one of the officers to come back to me, but I hadn't heard from her, so that's why I asked it today. Um, the second question is to Councillor Bentley. Um, as the Cabinet Member knows, I, along with many others, have been campaigning for years for a solid island roundabout to be installed at the dangerous Devil's Head crossroads in Morley, but funding has always been an issue. Um, it was hoped that we might get Section 106 monies from a development of the Ford HQ and the land opposite, but that now seems unlikely. Um, if that is the case, will the Cabinet Member give a commitment to the residents of my division that funding will be found by the County Council to install this much needed roundabout. Thank you. Well, Mr. Kendall will know in the days when we could, we both went there and I looked at that particular junction with him and we did do quite a bit of work there that was quite controversial, uh, but we got it done and it has improved uh, safety down there. Uh, look, it comes down to money, doesn't it? That's the answer to all of this. Uh, one in six contributions are increasingly difficult to get. Uh, out of uh, when especially they go to other services as well so additional money like this is not as easy as it could be um, uh, nonetheless if we can find the money we can have the money perhaps if you can also uh, talk to colleagues as well um, at Brentwood Borough Council and see what they're helping us well, we could do that because about safety of the public um, I certainly will look at any plans that will uh, be brought forward on the financing 
it's, a, it's not about not wanting to, it's just the, the will of making it happen, really. Thank you, Councillor Bentley. Right, we have our final speaker, questioner, Councillor Graham Butland. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, my question is to the Leader of the Council. Um, in view of some of the misinformation that was given during the debate on the amendment to Motion 4 this morning, can the Leader assure me that when setting the budget for 2021-22, he will take into account the public sector pay award to staff earning less than the median annual salary of 24,000 as part of tackling inequalities, which we agreed in motion two. Councillor Finch. Sounds like it's lawnmower. Councillor Finch. Yes. yes, is the answer. <laughs> yes. I think that's the reasonable one. It's the one I've been expecting from several several times this afternoon. You can always say yes or no. Well, thank you very much. And, um, you know, it's the last meeting before Christmas. I'd, I'd like to thank particularly all our employees, and you, you, you won't be able to see them, but I have Paul Turner and Joanna Bowler alongside, well, pretty well close to me, in strangely distant hall. Um, and actually, all our partners, all the residents, and, and, and all of you, because it's been a trying time, and in an odd sort of way, you've made these meetings work. And it has been challenging. Um, anyway, I wish you all a restful and peaceful break, and let's hope that, you know, victory is ahead for us. Gentlemen. I don't know about the cavalry tooting over the hill, but at least it does sound there is some optimism. Gentlemen, a healthy I, and happy year. Can I come back, please, Chairman, with something... Can I, also I wish. Thank, yeah, can I also thank you for chairing the meetings over last year? Here, here. Good job. Thank you. Well, that's kind of you, Andy and Barry, but no, really, it, it has been... We've adapted to this brilliantly well, and I hope, you, I hope you're satisfied with the way that we do the voting today. Very well, indeed. And let's hope we can get back into the, ta into the county hall again as soon as possible. So thank you all very much, and a very happy Christmas. Happy Christmas. And, and you, John. And you, Chairman. Happy Christmas.